Good morning, and welcome to the January 2021 open meeting of the Federal Communications Commission. Madam Secretary, could you please outline our agenda for the morning? Oh, Madam Secretary, yeah, you're muted, sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to you and good morning, commissioners. For today's meeting, you will hear a series of presentations from Commission Bureau, Office, and Task Force leaders summarizing the work their teams have done over the last four years. Presentations will be made in five panels. Panel one will include the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, the International Bureau, the Office of Engineering and Technology, and the Office of Economics and Analytics. Panel two will include the Wireline Competition Bureau and the Rural Broadband Auctions Task Force. Panel three will include the Media Bureau and the Incentive Auction Task Force. Panel four will include the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, the Enforcement Bureau, and the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau. And panel five will include the Office of Communications and Opportunities, the Office of the Managing Director, and the Office of General Counsel. This is your agenda for today. Please note item six, entitled Promoting Telehealth for Low-Income Consumers, seven, entitled Expanding Flexible Use of the 12.2 to 12.7 gigahertz band, and eight, entitled Competitive Bidding Procedures for auction 2.5 gigahertz band licenses on listed on the sunshine notice released January 7, 2021 have been adopted by the commission and deleted from today's agenda. Today's first panelists are Thomas Sullivan, Chief of the International Bureau, Ron Rapazzi, Acting Chief of the Office of Engineering and Technology, Julia McHenry, Chief of the Office of Economics and Analytics, and Donald Stockdale, Chief of the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, who will begin the presentation for panel one. Well, thank you, Madam Secretary. Thank and before you, turning it Secretary. over to our panelists, I want to recognize that this is a special day because we have a new colleague. Commissioner Nathan Symington was confirmed recently and sworn in. Uh, Commissioner, it is a pleasure to have you on the dais. We look forward to your public service in this position and welcome you uh, with open arms uh, to the Federal Communications Commission. I'm sure that you will find it as rewarding an experience laboring in the public interest as we have, and we're very excited to have you on the team. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Stockdale, the Chief of the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau for his presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. I'm proud today to briefly summarize some of the Wireless Telecommunication Bureau's key accomplishments over the last four years. I must start, however, by thanking the hardworking Bureau staff and by acknowledging the contributions to our work by all of the other bureaus and offices, particularly the Office of Engineering and Technology, the Office of Economics and Analytics, the Office of General Counsel, and the International Bureau. We are grateful for their input and collegiality. Next. Four years ago, 5G was little more than a buzzword to most consumers. But as of today, one U.S. carrier reports deployment of 5G service to areas where over 80% of our nation's population lives and all nationwide providers, as well as U.S. Cellular, are rapidly expanding their 5G deployments. 5G requires a diversity of spectrum to support a wide variety of applications. So, over the past four years, the Commission has made significant strides in pushing more spectrum across the entire frequency range into the marketplace, one of the core prongs of Chairman Pai's 5G FAST plan. In low band spectrum, the Bureau supported the work of the Incentive Auction Task Force in transitioning the 600 megahertz band from broadcast television to flexible use, including 5G. We also promoted more efficient use of low band spectrum in the 800 and 900 megahertz bands. 
At the high end, the commission is made available through three auctions, nearly five gigahertz of 5G spectrum in the 24, 28, 37, 39, and 47 gigahertz bands. This is more spectrum than had been used for terrestrial mobile broadband by all wireless service providers in the United States combined. The Commission also has made more than 500 megahertz of mid-band spectrum available for 5G deployments across the 2.5, 3.5, and 3.7 to 4.2 gigahertz bands. For example, in the 3.5 gigahertz band, the Wireless Bureau and the Office of Engineering and Technology authorized first of their kind automated frequency coordinators to allow for full commercial deployment in this 150 megahertz. The Commission also revised the rules for priority access licenses in this band to promote 5G deployment, which led to last summer's successful 3.5 gigahertz auction. We also continue to take critical steps toward new spectrum access opportunities, such as our recent work on the 3.45 gigahertz band. Now, one of the Commission's most important efforts to make more spectrum available for 5G occurred in the C band, which involved repurposing part of the 3.7 to 4.2 gigahertz band from satellite to terrestrial use. This posed an unprecedented challenge as it marked the first attempt by the Commission to repurpose satellite spectrum that was jointly controlled by several satellite operators. By overcoming a number of obstacles, the Commission made a large amount of valuable mid-band spectrum, 280 megahertz, available for 5G use. At the same time, the Commission protected the continuity of satellite services by relocating incumbent operators to the upper part of the band, thereby preserving uninterrupted video services for Americans during and after the transition. And thanks to OEA's auction division, the ongoing auction of this band has generated gross proceeds of more than $80 billion, by far the FCC's most lucrative spectrum auction ever. The Wireless Bureau has also advanced the Commission's initiatives to remove regulatory barriers to wireless infrastructure deployment, including through actions that streamline the process for state, local, and tribal review of wireless siting applications, including small wireless facilities, limited state, local, and tribal fees for such reviews, and simplified the FCC's historic preservation and environmental review processes. As a result of the Commission's infrastructure initiatives, particularly significant streamlining of federal, state, and local review in 2018, the wireless industry built more new cell sites in 2019 than in the previous three years combined. Indeed, according to data from CTIA, industry has deployed 10 times as many new cell sites over the past four years as in the four years before that. Wireless connectivity is essential to closing the di digital divide, particularly in rural communities. And the Wireless Bureau has advanced this key commission priority in several ways. For example, the commission transformed the 2.5 gigahertz band in 2019 by increasing flexibility for existing licensees and by creating new opportunities for rural tribal nations and other entities to access the band. The Bureau, working with the Office of Native Affairs and Policies, conducted extensive outreach to all 574 federally recognized tribes. We received over 400 tribal applications, and to date the Bureau has granted 182 licenses to tribal entities across the nation, enabling connectivity solutions in unserved and underserved rural tribal areas. I'm also especially proud of the work Bureau staff has done to ensure that Americans have access to critical wireless and broadband services during the COVID-19 pandemic. During these challenging months, the Bureau has, has acted swiftly to address COVID-related requests, including 
granting more than 275 STA requests to wireless providers, enabling access to additional spectrum to support telehealth, distance learning, and telework issuing emergency authorizations for over 300 critical infrastructure projects, and reviewing and approving requests for rule waivers and extensions of deadlines necessitated by the pandemic. The Wireless Bureau also joined with other bureaus and offices across agency to standardize and improve our broadband mapping through the digital opportunity data collection. This effort should facilitate future solutions targeted at deployment gaps. The Bureau also contributed to other commission initiatives addressing the digital divide, such as approving the T-Mobile Sprint merger, which included enforceable conditions requiring deployment of 5G network coverage to 99% of all Americans within six years. As part of the Commission-wide efforts to protect consumers and the public in general, the Wireless Bureau's initiatives also included ensuring that Americans are safe on the ground and in the air through deployment of positive train control technology and modernization of the radio, av aviation radio service. It also promoted assistive technologies for tens of millions of Americans with hearing loss by updating the FCC's hearing aid compatibility rules, and it assisted the chairman in promoting open source virtual radio access networks to spur American innovation and secure 5G networks. In addition to these broad-based policy matters, the Bureau, working with Office of Managing Director, advanced the Commission's plan to modernize IT systems, including initiating a new multi-year project to transition to a modern, configurable, and secure universal licensing system. The Bureau also is implementing the Commission's move to e-licensing, which will eliminate unnecessary paper licensing processes. In addition, the Bureau made important enhancements to a number of its IT systems, from providing interactive mapping tools for rural tribal priority window participants to upgrading the Commission's tower construction notification systems and E-106 system. At the same time, the Bureau has maintained its daily focus on efficiently processing incoming licensing applications, disposing of, on average, more than 400,000 license filings each year. In conclusion, I want to thank the entire Bureau staff for their extraordinary commitment to public service. None of these accomplishments would have been possible without their hard work, professionalism, and willingness to go the extra mile. Thank you, Chairman Pai and Commissioners. Well, thank you, Mr. Stocktail. Uh, we will now turn to uh, the Chief of the International Bureau, Mr. Tom Sullivan, for his presentation. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners and a warm welcome on behalf of IB to Commissioner Symington. I am very pleased to have this opportunity to highlight the significant accomplishments of the talented and hardworking staff of the International Bureau in support of the Commission's mission. Over the past four years, the Bureau has taken many actions to bridge the digital divide, promote innovation and investment, and enhance public safety and national security. We have done this through rulemakings, licensing actions, international leadership, and the commitment of our dedicated civil servants. Recognizing that time will not permit a thorough review, I will highlight today our most consequential achievements. One of the most significant developments in communications over the last four years has been the emergence of next generation satellite technologies involving advanced high throughput geostationary satellites as well as constellations of satellites in non-geostationary orbit, capable of delivering advanced services, including internet access to every corner of the Earth. These networks could be a game changer for efforts to bridge the digital divide in unserved or poorly served remote areas of the United States, as well as globally. 
we pave the way for the private sector to invest and innovate in these new technologies, reviewing and acting on 11 market access requests and space station applications for these new NGSO systems, each involving challenging technical and regulatory issues since June 2017. Several of these entities have already started deploying satellites in their constellations and offering services to end users. These NGSO systems are only one of the many promising innovations in the new era of space communications. Reflecting the FCC's focus on encouraging American leadership in this sector, we have taken several actions over the past four years to streamline our processes and update our regulations so that the domestic space industry can flourish. We created a new optional streamlined application for small satellites with short duration missions in order to encourage space-based startups to innovate in the United States. As you famously, or perhaps infamously, noted at the time, Mr. Chairman, there is no reason why a satellite the size of a shoebox with the life expectancy of a guinea pig should be regulated the same way as a satellite the size of a school bus that will stay in orbit for centuries. Recognizing the growing market for satellite mobility connectivity, we also updated FCC rules and expanded the frequencies available for Earth Stations in Motion, or ESIMs, communicating with geostationary satellite orbit networks, and established rules for ESIMs communicating with non-geostationary orbit networks. These actions will make it easier for consumers to obtain broadband connections in planes, trains, automobiles, and ships. Our focus on promoting space-based innovation continued through the November 2020 Commission meeting with adoption of an order streamlining our Part 25 satellite rules. The rule revisions harmonized the licensing process for many classes of satellite space stations and Earth stations, reduce burdens placed on applicants, and eliminate regulatory red tape standing in the way of the deployment of satellite-based services. While we have done much to facilitate the deployment of satellite technologies, we have also recognized the need to protect against the potential hazards posed by the increasingly populated orbital environment, especially the low Earth orbit environment. To that end, we developed robust rules to mitigate orbital debris and sought comment on additional ways to ensure that we are being responsible stewards in the new space age. It isn't all space services all the time in IB, though I would note that IB staff still have not fully recovered from Space Month in November 2018 when we presented eight items at the Commission meeting. But I digress. As I was saying, IB's focus on encouraging innovation and investment in new technologies extends beyond the space services sphere. Working closely with our federal partners and following an important executive order issued last spring, we substantially retooled the procedures that govern FCC coordination of applications involving foreign ownership with the executive branch, including Team Telecom. These process reforms will provide for a more efficient and effective review of the national security, law enforcement, trade, and foreign policy implications of foreign investment in our radio, television, and telecommunications industries. The Team Telecom process reform is also an integral part of the Bureau's work to enhance public safety by protecting the national security of our communication system. That work included scrutiny of several applications and authorizations to provide service in the United States by companies controlled by the Chinese government. Our scrutiny resulted in a denial of China Mobile USA's application to provide international telecommunication services in the United States because it is vulnerable to the exploitation, influence, and control of the Chinese government. It also resulted in the issuance of three joint IB, EB, WCB orders to show cause directing four additional Chinese government controlled companies to demonstrate why the commission should not start the process of revoking their domestic and international section 214 authorizations. And last month, it resulted in the launch of a proceeding to determine whether to end 
China Telecom America's authority to provide these services within the United States. Finally, we worked with Public Safety Homeland Security Bureau to improve the outage reporting obligations of submarine cable licensees to promote national security while streamlining the process for reporting submarine cable capacity. In addition to these regulatory actions, the FCC has been an integral part of the USG's efforts to promote 5G security. IB was pleased to support your leadership in that effort, Mr. Chairman, as you visited senior government officials in 11 countries and met with many more of your counterparts at the FCC, on the margins of other international meetings, and during the past nine months through virtual meetings. These efforts yielded tangible results with the adoption of the Prague proposals in 2019 and concrete actions by countries all over the world to prohibit high risk vendors from their networks and make their networks secure. As important as the FCC's regulatory and spectrum actions are, we can't achieve these successes in a bubble. We aren't the NBA after all. For many of the issues we address, like access to spectrum for both terrestrial and space-based services, and as just mentioned in the last slide, securing our 5G networks, we cannot do it alone. Though not as easy to quantify as orders and regulatory decisions, the Commission's international engagement is critical to advancing U.S. leadership and priorities. That happens at international level and multilateral organizations like the ITU, the OECD, ICAO, and the IMO. At the regional level, most importantly through CTEL in the Americas, and bilaterally with key countries, including our neighbors in Mexico, Canada, and our Caribbean partners. It also happens at international conferences and seminars and through IB's International Visitors Program and USTTI courses. One of the most visible manifestations of US leadership in the international telecom arena over the last four years was the election in 2018 of an American, Doreen Bogdan Martin, as the director of the ITU's development sector. The outreach efforts of FCC leadership were critical to the successful campaign for Doreen's election. We are especially pleased that Ms. Bogdan Martin's election made her the first woman to hold an elected position at the ITU. Long overdue and much deserved. On the multilateral front, the FCC's strategic engagement in the three years leading up to the 2019 World Radio Conference, along with the intensive efforts of our WRC Advisory Committee, or WAC, was crucial to ensuring successful outcomes for the United States. On most WRC agenda items, the WAC's recommendations became the foundation for U.S. proposals to CTEL, and in turn, the U.S. proposals became the foundation for CTEL inter-American proposals to the WRC. This regional leadership set us up for success at the WRC and enabled the United States to bring home an international regulatory framework enabling international harmonization and encouraging investments in next generation services globally. With the WRC 19 outcomes, there is now 17.25 gigahertz of spectrum identified for international mobile telecommunications. That identification gives governments the flexibility to use those bands for 5G. Of the 17.25 gigahertz of IMT spectrum, 14.75 gigahertz has been harmonized worldwide. To mention a few other important results, the WRC also adopted a number of regulatory improvements to permit expanded use by NGSO systems in several frequency bands, agreed to a new resolution that will boost the deployment of Earth stations in motion, and expanded the provision of a truly global maritime distress and safety system. On the bilateral front, we concluded or significantly advanced negotiations with Mexico and Canada on several new and amended arrangements for coordinating services along the border, including a new framework called the General Coordination Agreement 
governing 81 distinct frequency sharing instruments between the US and Canada. The GCA, which will be going through the formal signing procedure just this week after almost two decades of negotiations, will make it much easier to implement changes to border protocols as technologies and spectrum use evolve. I stated at the outset that the Bureau's accomplishments over the past four years are reflected in rulemakings, licensing actions, international leadership, and the commitment of our staff. I want to finish with some statistics that I believe demonstrate that commitment to serve the public interest. I won't read all the statistics in this chart, but do want to highlight the Bureau's C-band efforts, in particular, the work to facilitate the transition of Earth Station antennas out of the lower portion of the C-band to enable the auction of that spectrum for critical 5G services. Those efforts included our review of nearly 23,000 C-band Earth Station antenna registrations filed during a six-month window in 2018, as well as our review of 1,500 lump sum elections in only six weeks last fall, resulting in the acceptance of elections for more than 12,500 incumbent Earth stations. Perhaps keeping staff hopped up on sugar with weekly Thursday cake day gatherings helped, but really the statistics on this last slide and all the accomplishments I highlighted today reflect the dedication and professionalism of IB staff. I'd like to close by thanking them for their commitment to the public interest, especially over the past nine months in the midst of a global pandemic, and for making IB look good at home and the FCC look good abroad. Very well said. Uh, thank you, uh, Chief Sullivan. Uh, we will now turn to the Acting Chief of the Office of Engineering and Technology, Mr. Ron Rapazzi. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. On behalf of the outstanding staff in the Office of Engineering and Technology, I am pleased to present this report that highlights many of OET's activities and accomplishments over the past four years. I also want to acknowledge the work of the other bureaus and offices. OET's work cuts across the commission in, on many major rulemakings and initiatives, and we have, we have worked on, and it would not have been successful without the collaboration of our colleagues. OET's core mission is to manage the radio spectrum and provide technical leadership to create new opportunities for innovation and economic growth. As the pace of innovation has quickened, resolving the challenging spectrum and engineering issues we face is even more challenging or more crucial to meeting the FCC's strategic objectives. One of our most important objectives is to make spectrum available for new technology, and nowhere has that been more evident than under the 5G FAST plan. OET has been instrumental in modifying spectrum allocations undertaking thorough analyses and reviewing technical studies. In the 600 megahertz band, OET helped to ensure that flexible use service authorized in a portion of this band could successfully coexist with other services. OET also provided expert technical analysis in permitting terrestrial access in the L-band spectrum to support industrial Internet of Things and 5G applications. On high band spectrum, OET developed technical rules for new 5G systems to share with incumbent users, both federal and non-federal, in a multitude of millimeter wave allocations. And in the critical mid-band, OET worked to enable 5G use of C-band and CBRS. OET has been involved in CBRS development and deployment from conception of the novel dynamic spectrum sharing approach to approving the spectrum access systems and environmental sensing capabilities. OET helped to unleash an unprecedented amount of spectrum for unlicensed use in the 6 gigahertz band, the 5.9 gigahertz band, white spaces, and spectrum horizons. 1,200 megahertz of 6, band, mid -band, 6 gigahertz mid-band spectrum were made available for unlicensed use to usher in the next generation of Wi-Fi. This action increased the amount of mid-band spectrum available for Wi-Fi by nearly a factor of five and will offer better performance for American consumers. An additional 45 megahertz of mid-band spectrum that have largely been unused for decades 
were also made available in the 5.9 gigahertz band. It is adjacent to an existing Wi-Fi band, and when combined, another 160 megahertz wideband channel is now available for Wi-Fi. In the low band spectrum, white space device rules were expanded to help the delivery of broadband services in rural and underserved communities and to provide flexibility for new narrowband Internet of Things applications while protecting from harmful interference broadcast television stations. And in the high band spectrum, 21.2 gigahertz of spectrum were made available for data intensive high bandwidth unlicensed applications. The Spectrum Horizons rules also create a new category of experimental use to help ensure that the United States stays at the forefront of wireless innovation. OET released a new speed test app to gather performance data for mobile networks as part of the Measuring Broadband America program. OET also oversees wireline ISP measurements to monitor broadband performance across the United States. And OET supports independent researchers using the Measuring Broadband America platform to gather their own data for analyses. OET works to promote innovation in many ways, and two key pillars of that work are the experimental licensing and equipment authorization programs. We have modernized both of these programs recently. We have seen 33% more experimental license applications processed per year than four years prior. We created two real-world innovation zones in New York City and Salt Lake City to empower advanced wireless technology and 5G-ready network experimentation. And experimental licenses are used today to support development of emerging technologies such as commercial space launches and unmanned aerial systems. The Equipment Authorization Program has also been streamlined to promote efficiency. OET developed new self-certification and e-labeling provisions. Today, more than 25,000 device modules are certified each year. OET's lab also supports our Enforcement Bureau colleagues to ensure that devices of all types comply with the Commission's technical rules. Another key to innovation is enabling novel use of spectrum. We carefully evaluate when warranted and when warranted grant waiver requests from innovators to meet public interest demands while avoiding harmful interference to authorized services. OET has granted waivers for devices used in agricultural, industrial, medical, transportation, and securities industry, as well as for innovative productivity and lifestyle devices. OET continually reviews and updates our rules to accommodate new technologies. Some recent examples of this are vehicular radar systems, remote wireless charging, and wireless microphones. Importantly, we have also streamlined our RF exposure regulations to promote innovation while protecting the public. OET has helped meet the challenges of responded to COVID-19 in multiple ways. We granted a limited waiver of our rules to allow one company to expedite the importation of new medical devices and another to introduce contact tracing technologies. We have also helped keep Americans connected by coordinating with our federal partners to allow wireless internet service providers to operate at higher power levels to boost their rural, and rural coverage and service. OET also promoted the development of innovative and non-invasive security scanning portals. Several companies were granted authorization to develop high-speed devices that can screen nearly 60 people a minute to detect firearms and other dangerous items. Just as technology continues to evolve, OET has kept pace through significant actions to modernize our operations and programs. I'm especially proud of OET's role in launching the FCC's Honors Engineering Program to seek new engineering talent to work on cutting edge issues in communications and technology. The program is off and running. To date, we've hired five Honors Engineers who are working with senior engineers on some of the most exciting technology issues in the Commission. It is also noteworthy 
that our OET developed training program was so well received that we expanded it more broadly to all commission employees. OET has also invested in its equipment and facilities to ensure that we keep a pace with industry. The newest and biggest development, quite literally, is the new 5G anechoic chamber that we recently installed at our laboratory. The state-of-the-art chamber and equipment will provide our engineers the necessary tools to test all manner of 5G devices and novel equipment. Finally, in the past four years, we've witnessed some fond farewells but we've also welcomed new people to OET. Our success can only be attributed to the incredibly dedicated and talented people that make up our office. We have a solid and successful legacy to build upon, and we look forward to meeting the challenges ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rapazzi, for that presentation. And we'll now turn to uh, the Chief of the Office of Economics and Analytics, uh, Dr. Jillian McHenry. Uh, Ms. McHenry, the floor is yours. Oh, yeah, you're uh, muted, sorry. That's a slow start. Okay, let's try again. Thank you, Chairman Pai and Commissioners Carr, Rosen, Worsell, Starks, and Symington. The Office of Economics and Analytics, or OEA, is the newest office at the FCC. It launched in December 8, 2018, combining economists, data specialists, attorneys, and other staff from across the commission to consistently and thoroughly incorporate economic and data analysis into the commission's work. And I wanna thank the entire staff of OEA for their hard work in standing up and meeting the mission of OEA. As noted in, recent in a recent editorial published by three former FCC economists, the establishment of the new office to integrate economic and data analysis into FCC policymaking is among the signature accomplishments of this commission. In April 2017, Chairman Pai laid out his vision for an independent office to ensure that the commission's choices are consistently informed by sound economic principles and solid data. A working group led by OEA Senior Deputy Chief Wayne Layton studied the chairman's proposals and in January 2018 issued a report and recommendations. In late January 2018, the commission released an order to establish OEA. After obtaining approvals from Congress, OMB, and the Employees Union, the office began operations on December 7, 2018. Today, there are more than 110 employees across the front offices and four divisions. OEA also houses the Commission's Chief Economist and Chief Data Officer. Importantly, OEA's role is primarily to inform and support policymaking, rather than offering its own policy recommendations. Consistent with its founding vision and the Commission's directive, and in close coordination with the bureaus and offices, OEA provides independent, objective economic analysis regarding the Commission's policy choices, including analysis of costs and benefits. It develops best practices to manage data collections and resources. It designs and manages spectrum, broadband sub subsidies, and other auctions. And it conducts long-term research. While it is impossible to acknowledge every contribution, I would like to provide a brief overview of each of the four divisions and their most significant accomplishments. But before I do, I would also like to extend OEA's appreciation to all the bureaus and offices for working to ensure OEA's success. The, the Economic Analysis Division serves as an in-house economic consultancy supporting all bureaus and offices, ensuring that the FCC incorporates professional standards for economics into its processes. EAD brought together approximately 40 economists and other experts from across the agency. Consolidating the FCC's economists in a single office has strengthened the role and quality of economic analysis. Just look at the 2020 Communications Marketplace Report and the T-Mobile Sprint Merger Review. These complex, voluminous items required large, flexible teams of economists with cross-cutting expertise. In addition, EAD has delivered on the promise to provide an economic review of nearly all pertinent commission items. It has reviewed over 450 items since its inception. Here are just a few examples where economic review and analysis help to improve the commission's policies the 5G adjustment factors, the C-band auction, the establishment of the National 988 suicide hotline, 
inmate calling services, audio description rules, internet protocol, caption telephone services, and universal service. The core of the industry analysis division came to OEA from the Wireline Competition Bureau. It produces high quality data, data essential to the FCC rule policymaking. IAD designs and administers the FCC's highest profile data collections. This includes preparing reports, data sets, and maps for release to the public. It also provides analytical support as needed across the agency. Here are just some of the recurring data projects IAD has implemented since the inception of OEA. Four semi-annual Form 477 broadband deployment, internet access, and voice service de data collections two universal service monitoring reports, and a third forthcoming, two urban rate surveys, a study area boundaries data collection, two telephone numbering utilization reports, the 2020 cable price survey, and the list goes on. IAD also implemented and analyzed the FCC's one-off 2020 supply chain data collection and the inmate calling services data collection, and made significant contributions to the COVID-19 telehealth, COVID telehealth program. The effort to collect and clean data is substantial. <laughs> For example, in the last two years, through four rounds of semi-annual 477 data collections, IAD has received and processed roughly 15,000 files, including 120 million rows of fixed broadband data and processed 3,500 data quality inquiries. Now to the data division. The data division is a new organization within OEA. With the growing volume and importance of data at the FCC, the data division and the chief data officer develop best practices, processes, and standards for data management agency-wide. They are responsible for implementing the Foundations for Evidence-Based Policymaking Act of 2018, also known as the Evidence Act, and the Federal Data Strategy. The Evidence Act and Federal Data Strategy are new federal data initiatives that prescribe a broad range of activities to improve all aspects of the agency's management of the data lifecycle. These include acquisition, collection, storage, maintenance, access, use, analysis, dissemination, sharing, archiving, and disposal of the agency's data, plus protection of personal and confidential information. The data division team often collaborates closely with IAD with the data division developing critical systems underlying data collections. Recent examples include the aforementioned supply chain data collection and the COVID-19 telehealth program. The data division and IAD are also helping the commission to prepare for implementation of the Broadband Data Act and the FCC's forthcoming digital opportunity data collection. Last, but certainly not least, the auctions division makes Spectrum available for advanced services and helps provide universal support for deployment in unserved areas. The division came to OEA from the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. Since April 2017, it has conducted 10 auctions in coordination with the wireless, wireline, and media bureaus. Five of these auctions offered wireless licenses in furtherance of the Commission's 5G FAST plan making available 4,950 megahertz of high band spectrum and 350 megahertz of mid band spectrum for 5G. Two were descending price or reverse auctions to efficiently assign universal service support for fixed voice and broadband services. And three were FM translator construction permits, two of which implemented the commission's AM revitalization policies. In the design and execution of these auctions, the division has upheld a tradition of innovation and breaking new ground. It assigned more than 26,000 mid-band licenses and 20,000 high-band licenses for 5G. The ongoing C-band auction is also the largest grossing FCC auction ever at over $80 billion. The CBRS auction offered the most wireless licenses in a single auction at 22,631. It attracted the most applicants for wireless license at licenses at 348, and there were 228 winning bidders. We also held three auctions to assign high band spectrum for 5G for the first time. These included our second ever incentive auction, which assigned licenses at the upper 37, 39, and 47 gigahertz band, and offered the most bandwidth in a single auction, 3,400 megahertz.
The CAF 2 and RDOF reverse options assign nearly $11 billion over 10 years to hundreds of providers in 49 states and one territory to deploy fixed broadband to unserved areas. To conclude, the creation of, of a new Office of Economics and Analytics has been remarkably successful. We are opt optimizing the FCC's economic and data resources. We are un ensuring that commission actions are consistently informed by sound economic principles and data. We are elevating economics, data, and auctions at the FCC. We are reviving the tradition of visionary long-term policy research at the FCC, having issued four white papers in the first two years, with one more to come tomorrow and many more in the future. And we have built relationships and processes across the organization to lay the groundwork for OEA's continuing success. Thank you for your support and thank you for the opportunity to present for you today. Well, thank you, uh, Chief McHenry, for your presentation on behalf of OEA. Uh, would any of my colleagues like to offer any comments on the presentations that we have heard? Uh, just for my part, uh, I just want to express my gratitude and appreciation for all the work the FCC staff has done. And it's uh, a tremendous amount in normal times, uh, in COVID times, you know, juggling all kinds of additional obligations and responsibility. Uh, it's really remarkable, uh, the productivity. So kudos uh, to the teams across all those bureaus presenting. And, um, and obviously, we'll get into more of this later, but to the, the chairman and his team for supporting uh, the staff and all their work here. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, anybody else? Oh, Commissioner Rizzo-Rissell. Yeah, I just want to likewise say thank you to the staff. Um, but in the interest of moving things along uh, and this uh, proceeding in a timely way, I will offer more thoughts at the end. All right. Oh, uh, Commissioner Starks, then. Yes, similarly, uh, it obviously is a, a significant body of work. And, and again, as I've said before, um, to, to many, uh, where we were building the plane while flying it, uh, this has been a, a year for a lot of uh, us as we're uh, both working and balancing. So congratulations for the great work. Well, thanks. And uh, for, you know, for my part, I just want to say thank you to each of our incredible presenters, to Don Stockdale, uh, yeah, obviously the tip of the spear on 5G, an incredibly thoughtful person, and shepherding through things like the C-band, one of the most complicated proceedings we've ever had. You've been an incredible leader. Uh, to Tom Sullivan, I mean, uh, just I th can't thank you enough for all you've done here and abroad. And you know, the memory that comes to my mind when I think of you is when we were heading to, I think it was to Dubai to help elect Doreen Bogdan Martin. And you, Rachel Bender, and I were stuck in the airport in Newark, which is not exactly where, you know, where fun goes to thrive. Um, and uh, you just happened to mention casually, oh, it was your 50th birthday. And we excoriated you for spending your time with us as opposed to with your family. But it just speaks to the fact that you're a truly dedicated public servant. And I never forgot that. Thank you. Uh, to Ron Rapazzi, you've been an incredible leader of the Office of Engineering and Technology. Obviously, you had some big shoes to fill. And we rewarded you by saying, hey, would you like to go brief some uh, hostile pe people in the lion's den on Legato? Uh, and you really had the ability to, you know, to explain technical and complicated concepts in a very simple and easy under to understand way. And you are a great leader of the office. So thank you for that. And to Julia McHenry, I mean, it's one thing to break the mold. It's another thing entirely to make the mold, which is exactly what you did. And you know, thanks to all of the great work that you did and Wayne Layton, you have now set in place an OEA that is fully integrated in the FCC's workflows. It's second nature, I think, to all of us now to think, hey, what do the economists think? What do the auction staff think? What do the data analytics uh, folks think? And uh, that's a tribute to your leadership and to all of the staff under each of your bureaus or offices leadership. Uh, you know, thank you for everything that you've done over the past four years. Uh, we couldn't have done it without you, so thank you. Uh, with that, Madam Secretary, could you please announce the next panel on today's agenda? Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, next you will hear a presentation from, pa from panel two featuring Chris Monteith, Chief of the Wireline Competition Bureau, followed by Michael Jansen, Director of the Rural Broadband Auctions Task Force. Well, thank you, Madam Secretary. Madam the last Secretary. time I'll be able to say it, but Camo, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to you, to Commissioner Carr, Commissioner Rosenworcel, Commissioner Starks, and a warm welcome, Commissioner Symington. 
The Wireline Competition Bureau has had an exciting, fulfilling, and extraordinarily meaningful four years working for the American public and helping to achieve the Commission's top strategic goals of closing the digital divide, promoting innovation, protecting consumers and public safety, and reforming the FCC's processes. We have worked aggressively to achieve these objectives from the beginning of your chairmanship. And when the COVID-19 pandemic struck, we took on additional responsibilities to quickly implement congressional directives and provide relief in a number of significant ways. Our achievements are too many to cover adequately here so I will use this opportunity to highlight just a few key examples of the Bureau's tremendous work. And I want to note that many of these achievements were collaborative efforts with our colleagues from other bureaus and offices, which is a hallmark of the Commission's processes and cultures. Before turning to the highlights, however, a quick snapshot of the Bureau. The Wireline Competition Bureau's mission is to ensure that all Americans have access to robust, affordable broadband and voice services and to protect and foster competition. We work to achieve our mission through a front office and three divisions, the Competition Policy, Pricing Policy and Telecommunications Access Policy Divisions. We also oversee three important federal advisory committees, the North American Numbering Council, the Broadband Deployment Advisory Committee, and the Precision Agriculture Connectivity Task Force. We are 157 employees strong. Under Chairman Pai's leadership, the Commission's number one priority has been closing the digital divide and bringing the benefits of the internet age to all Americans. The Bureau, through our work on universal service and our work to remove regulatory barriers, has played an integral role. Our universal service support helped to expand broadband in high cost areas to more than 2.5 million homes and businesses between 2017 and 2019 and we secured commitments to expand broadband to approximately 8.2 million additional locations. We awarded funding through the Unienda Puerto Rico Fund and Connect USVI Fund to expand, improve, and harden broadband networks in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands areas that have suffered so much devastation to communications infrastructure in recent years. We further strengthened universal service and enhanced program programmatic efficiency and accountability for all USF programs, for instance, by implementing performance measures for high cost recipients, promoting the deployment of Wi-Fi for schools and libraries, boosting funding for rural health care providers, and launching the National Lifeline Eligibility Verifier in all states and territories, including Washington, D.C. We promoted broadband deployment and competition with one-touch make-ready and pole attachment reform by speeding up the attachment process, reducing costs, and increasing transparency. And we removed regulatory barriers to upgrading networks and transitioning to next generation technologies by streamlining discontinuance rules and eliminating unnecessary network change rules. As a result of our efforts, the digital divide has narrowed considerably. For example, since 2016, the number of rural Americans lacking access to broadband with speeds of at least 25.3 megabits per second has fallen by more than 46%. To promote investment, innovation, and broadband deployment, the Bureau led the Commission in one of its most significant achievements, restoring internet freedom. 
In doing so, the commission turned to the law, returned to the longstanding bipartisan light touch regulatory framework that had fostered rapid internet growth, openness, and freedom for nearly 20 years. The decision reversed heavy handed utility style regulation on broadband providers. And since adoption, Average fixed broadband download speeds in the United States have more than doubled and service providers have invested billions in their network and set records for fiber deployment. The DC Circuit upheld the vast majority of the Commission's decision, remanding three discrete issues, which the Bureau teed up for the Commission's consideration this past October. The commission then adopted an order concluding in each case that there was no basis on which to alter the conclusions in the commission's original decision. We are also committed to protecting consumers and public safety. Here, for example, we strengthened the nation's security by ending universal service fund support for any company posing a national security threat to the integrity of communication networks or the communication supply chain. Specifically, in coordination with the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, we designated Huawei and ZTE as threats to our national security and began the process of removing and replacing their equipment in our networks. We combated caller ID spoofing by implementing the Trace Act and implementing the implementation, excuse me, and mandating the implementation of the shake and stir caller ID authentication framework. We assisted incarcerated individuals and their families by reforming rates, charges, and practices for inmate calling services. We helped Americans in crisis by designating 988 to become the nationwide suicide prevention and mental health crisis hotline number beginning July 16th, 2022. During the transition to 888-988, Americans who need help should continue to contact the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline by calling 1-800-273-8255 or 1-800-273-TALK. And we save consumers money by eliminating wasteful arbitrage schemes that exploit the system of intercarrier compensation between local and long distance service providers. At the same time, the Bureau did not lose sight of the need to make the commission more efficient by reforming our processes, modernizing our regulations and removing regulatory burdens. Among many efforts, the Bureau has modernized outdated network unbundling obligations by granting incumbent local exchange carriers relief from 1996 era regulatory obligations where they were no longer necessary for competitive entry. We eliminated tariffing and ex-ante pricing regulation of high-speed services. We conducted the commission's first ever auction of toll-free numbers. We removed unnecessary accounting requirements, which will allow carriers to refocus scarce resources towards expanding and modernizing their networks and removed outdated legacy voice service regulations by eliminating avoided cost resale obligations and redundant notice requirements in addition to streamlining discontinuance relief. The global COVID-19 pandemic caused seismic shifts in the way many of us work, learn, access healthcare, and stay connected to family and friends. As the commission moved to mandatory telework to keep our staff safe, the Bureau responded to the pandemic without missing a beat by swiftly implementing newly enacted programs and providing relief where we could as Americans continue to face incredible and unprecedented challenges. Within a few days of the CARES Act being signed into law, 
the Bureau, with the help of colleagues throughout the agency, designed and launched the COVID-19 telehealth program and within a matter of weeks exhausted the $200 million budget Congress established by funding much needed devices and services for healthcare providers throughout the country to help battle the pandemic. And just last week, we initiated round two of the program, which received an additional nearly $250 million from Congress. The Bureau also ensured connectivity for schools, libraries, and healthcare facilities by waiving certain program rules, extending deadlines, and increasing funding opportunities. We partnered with the Department of Education to promote the CARES Act funding for remote learning, waive several lifeline program rules to help low-income in consumers keep and maintain the broadband service that has been so crucial during the pandemic, and we provided regulatory relief to ensure consumers would not lose access to software platforms so essential to school and work. Finally, just recently at the end of 2020, the Bureau began implementation of the $3.2 billion emergency broadband connectivity fund. This new program will reimburse participating companies for providing discounted broadband service and connected devices to eligible households during the COVID-19 pandemic. In short, it has been an incredibly productive and busy four years for the Bureau. By rough count, the Bureau circulated and the Commission adopted over 160 Commission level items. An impressive, an impressive number for sure, but one which does not reflect the enormous day-to-day -day work and activities of the Bureau. Again, by rough count, the Bureau adopted and or released over 2,700 Bureau level items. The Telecommunications Access Policy Division resolved nearly 4,000 USAC appeals. The Competition Policy Division processed over 235 Section 214 transfer of control transactions and 292 discontinuance applications. And the Pricing Policy Division processed over 15,000 tariff filings. The scope and importance of this incredible work deserves recognition. Finally, I want to say to you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership, a big thank you, and to the tremendous WCB staff, a big thank you. Their hard work and commitment over these four years has been fantastic. The staff approaches their work with the utmost professionalism and dedication. Their extraordinary commitment to public service is unparalleled. This past year has greatly tested all of our resolve and determination. Despite the obstacles and challenges, the staff of the Bureau has continually exceeded expectations. At, over the past four years at our gatherings, as you know, we have a monthly gathering to celebrate our many accomplishments. I've had opportunities to thank the staff for their tremendous work, sadly not in person over the last 10 months. I would like to take this opportunity to again applaud everyone in the Bureau for their hard work, their dedication, and their commitment. It has been my honor and privilege to work alongside you, Mr. Chairman, and your staff, and to count each of the members of the WCB staff, not only as a colleague, but as, as part of my family and a friend. Thank you to the WCB staff for everything that you do day in and day out on behalf of the American public. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, amen to that, uh, Chief Monteith. Uh, with that, we'll turn to the director of our Rural Broadband Auctions Task Force, Mr. Michael Jansen. And Mr. Jansen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman Pai and Commissioners Carr, Rosenworcel, Starks, and Symington. 
The Rural Broadband Auctions Task Force oversees and coordinates the work across the agency on the use of reverse auctions to award universal service high cost support. I am the director of the task force. Kirk Berge from WCB and Jonathan McCormick from OEA are the deputy directors and Audra Hale Maddox from OEA is the chief of staff. The task force was formed in early 2017 to move forward the monumental and highly innovative effort to use auctions to allocate universal service support to unserved areas. Chelsea Fallon was the first director of the task force leading this effort from 2017 to 2019. The task force has overseen the Connect America Phase 2 auction, the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund Phase 1 auction, and the establishment of the 5G Fund for Rural America. This work has included staff, attorneys, economists, engineers, project managers, and analysts from almost every bureau and office in the agency, and at times involved close to 100 staff working together on tight deadlines. In 2018, the task force oversaw the Connect America Phase Two auction, known as Auction 903. This was the first multiple round reverse auction to award ongoing high cost support to deploy broadband to unserved areas. The auction was technologically neutral and used innovative weighted tiers that made more support available to services with faster speeds and lower latencies. Bidding concluded in August 2018 and resulted in awards of almost $1.5 billion to over 100 winning bidders to deploy service to over 700,000 locations across the country. Almost all of the support went to provide deployment of services with speeds of at least 25 megabits per second down and three megabits per second up. The post-auction process of reviewing long form applications is almost complete. And as of now, nearly all of this support has been authorized for broadband deployments. This program is bringing high speed broadband to unserved areas across the country. Chairman Pai visited Wind River Internet, a tribally owned provider that was awarded 4.1 million in CAF2 and is bringing broadband to more than 800 homes and businesses on the Wind River Reservation in rural Wyoming. Another is example is East Central Electric Cooperative, which was awarded 22.2 million to bring gigabit broadband to 7,700 locations in rural Oklahoma including for many tribal residents of the Creek Nation. In 2020, the task force oversaw the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund phase one auction known as Auction 904. This auction built upon the success of Auction 903 and used a similar design with weighted tiers that encouraged participation from all technologies with more support available to higher speeds and lower latencies and included additional measures to promote future-proofed high-speed, low-latency deployments. Bidding ended on November 25th, 2020, and the auction awarded $9.2 billion to 180 winning bidders to deploy service to some 5.2 million unserved locations in 49 states and one territory. The winning bidders included electric cooperatives, cable operators, incumbent telephone companies, satellite companies, fixed wireless providers, and consortia that included dozens of smaller companies. As you can see on this map of Rural Digital Opportunity Fund phase one results, support was awarded across the country with almost all eligible areas being awarded support. Of those areas awarded support, 99.7 received support for broadband at speeds of at least 100 megabits per second down and 20 megabits per second up with the vast majority, almost 85%, receiving support for gigabit speed broadband. Long form applications from winning bidders are due by January 29th. And the task force has been busy preparing for this immense work of reviewing these applications and authorizing support to get these awarded funds out to unserved areas as quickly as possible. Phase two of the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund will make support available to partially served high cost areas identified using new broadband coverage maps that will be developed in the commission's digital opportunity data collection, along with the relatively few areas that were eligible but were not won in the phased one auction. 
In 2011, the commission began the process of reforming high cost support for mobile broadband. Based upon concerns about reported mobile broadband coverage maps submitted in the Mobility Fund Phase II proceeding, the commission began an investigation. FCC field agents conducted their own tests to assess the accuracy of the reported mobile coverage. And the staff report found that providers submitted mobile coverage did not reflect consumers on the ground experience. Recognizing that universal service should focus on deploying today's technology to rural Americans and not yesterday's, the commission adopted the 5G fund for rural America last year. This fund builds on the success of the CAF2 and Rural Digital Opportunity Fund phase one auctions, adopting a similar two-phase multi-round reverse auction approach. This fund will make up to 9 billion available to support the deployment of 5G in unserved areas. Importantly, adopting the 5G fund also at long last brought to fruition the commission's stated intention in 2011 that any pause in the reform of mobile high cost support would be accompanied with the adoption of additional public interest obligations for legacy recipients. These public interest obligations took effect at the beginning of this year, and they ensure that areas receiving legacy support also receive 5G deployments and are not left behind. The 5G fund will distribute support in two phases with up to 8 billion available in the first phase based upon new mobile data coverage collected through the digital opportunity data collection. The second phase will make at least 1 billion plus the remainder of the phase one budget available for 5G deployments that facilitate precision agriculture. In conclusion, I would like to say um, thank you to all of the staff that worked on all of these projects. The task force has moved forward all of these programs collaboratively with staff across the agency and with remarkable efficiency. It has been an honor to advance these vital universal service programs to bridge the digital divide with so many dedicated staff from across the agency. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Jansen, for your remarks. Uh, would any of my colleagues like to offer any comments at this time? I want to again just uh, reiterate my you know, appreciation and thanks to, to the team. Uh, just a tremendous amount of, of work that was uh, accomplished and really appreciate all of the, uh, the, the sacrifices uh, that went into to getting that done. So thank you so much for your service. And I'll, oh, sorry, I don't know if anyone else. Um, yes, yeah, no, uh, thank you for the hard work. Okay. Oh, Commissioner Simington. Yeah, yes, thank you. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't have the opportunity earlier to thank the presenters from the first panel, but I wanted to express my appreciation uh, to them and their teams for all of their hard work in addition to those from the current panel. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, for my part, uh, Ms. Monteith, you've been an incredible leader of the Wireline Competition Bureau. I know how much we've asked of you and how much you've delivered. And also, not only how you've led your own team, but how you've worked so well with external entities, USAC, the Nancy, uh, the Hill Inquiries, et cetera. You've had an incredibly hard job and you've discharged it with expertise and collegiality and aplomb. And I cannot thank you enough for all the work you've done to address our top priority, closing the digital divide, a very simple concept that is mirrored by its incredible complexity when it comes to structuring and executing these initiatives. So thank you for that. And the same with Michael Jansen. Uh, we obviously have stood up uh, some pretty aggressive initiatives, but through the RBAT, you've been able to shepherd through really the key, the core uh, part of our digital divide agenda. And uh, thank you for obviously working with all stakeholders to make sure that we were able to get these universal service fund programs, uh, again, structured and executed in a way that delivers results for the American people. And the results are there for people to see in places like Athiti, Wyoming, where the Wind River uh, Reservation is now home to people connected with broadband. Not bad for a day's work. Uh, thank you both. And uh, with that, Madam Secretary, can you please take us thank to you. the next panel on today's agenda? Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, next you will hear presentations from panel three featuring Michelle Carey, Chief of the Media Bureau, followed by Jean Cadu, Chair of the Incentive Auction Task Force. All right, uh, Ms. Carey, if you're there, the, we, floor, we turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, and welcome to you, Commissioner Symington. 
Thank you for the opportunity to highlight the work of the Media Bureau over the past four years. In addition to rulemakings, the Bureau also handles many types of adjudications and processes thousands of applications for the 33,000 broadcast licensees that we oversee. First, taking a look at television, administering the post incentive auction television repack and $2.5 billion reimbursement program has been a huge priority for us over the past few years. The incentive auction task force will discuss this in more detail later. Still, as broadcast television underwent this transition, one of the first actions we undertook was to position TV stations for the future by enabling them to use the next generation television standard known as ATSC 3.0 on a voluntary market driven basis. This technology is the world's first internet protocol based television standard, providing stations with the ability to deliver many new features and better serve their viewers. Stations in 23 markets are already broadcasting in ATSC 3 and retailers are carrying 20 television models with built-in tuners capable of receiving ATSC 3.0 signals. The Bureau has also worked hard to support the pioneers of electronic mass communications, radio stations. Commercial Radio just celebrated its 100th anniversary last November. For the FM band, we updated our rules to improve the comparative selection procedures for new non-commercial educational and low power FM or LPFM stations in order to reduce confusion among future applicants and accelerate the initiation of new service to the public. We modernized the LPFM technical rules to provide these stations additional flexibility. And we streamlined FM translator interference rules to expedite the translator complaint trans, uh, resolution process. On the AM side, we sought to preserve the AM radio service for future listeners through the AM revitalization initiative. In this regard, the Commission has authorized over 2,800 AM stations to build cross service FM translators. More than 1,750 of these stations have been constructed and are currently on the air. We also updated our AM technical rules to simplify compliance and reduce unnecessary regulatory burdens. And most significantly, we authorized AM stations to voluntarily end analog broadcasts and adopt all digital broadcasting. This will allow AM stations to offer listeners higher quality audio and new ancillary data services. Of course, Given that the Media Bureau regulates century old services, one of the challenges was to ensure that our rules continue to achieve their intended results in the current digital age. That is why in 2017, the commission initiated a review of the rules applicable to media outlets. All in all, we ended up commencing 22 proceedings. These proceedings resulted in 26 orders that eliminated or updated a number of obsolete burdensome or outmoded rules. For example, to better reflect the competitive video marketplace, we revamped TV stations children's programming requirements and ease cable operators lease access obligations. We also eliminated a variety of ancient and now unnecessary record keeping requirements. Because of these efforts, broadcasters cable and DBS operators will operate more efficiently by saving costs and complying with their FCC obligations. Speaking of rule updates, we took action to level the regulatory playing field. Specifically, one of our most notable accomplishments was clarifying the regime established in the Cable Act for how franchising authorities may regulate cable operators. Consistent with the terms of the statute, our new rules sought to promote broadband investment and deployment by, pro by prohibiting excess franchise fees and preventing state and local governments from regulating most non-cable services. These revised rules responded to a remand from the Sixth Circuit. Likewise, we took into account the changing nature of the video market by interpreting Section 623 of the Cable Act to recognize that streaming services can provide effective competition to traditional cable services. This order was recently affirmed by the First Circuit. We continued our efforts to ensure that our rules reflect the fast changing media landscape through significant update of the Commission's media ownership rules. Among other things, we eliminated the newspaper cross ownership ban, 
a rule in place since 1975, and we reformed the local television ownership rule by um, eliminating the eight voices test. These changes were designed to permit pro-competitive combinations that promise to strengthen local voices and also enable both newspapers and broadcast stations to better serve their communities. Importantly, we also sought to promote diversity in the media by creating the Innovative Broadcaster Inter in Incubator Program to pair small aspiring radio station owners with established broadcasters that would help with training, finances, mentoring, and industry connections. While our efforts to match our media ownership rules to reflect marketplace realities were rejected 2-1 by the same divided Third Circuit panel that has blocked the Commission's efforts to modernize their media ownership rules for almost 20 years, in a historic turn, the Supreme Court granted the Commission's petition for writ of certiorari to review the Third Circuit's decision and is holding oral arguments next Tuesday. Although the court battle has created a degree of uncertainty over our media ownership initiatives, that did not stop the Federal Advisory Committee on Diversity and Digital Empowerment from an active agenda. Rechartered by Chairman Pai in 2017 and again in 2019, the committee provides advice and recommendations to the commission on how to accelerate, on how to empower disadvantaged communities and accelerate the entry of small media businesses, including those owned by women and minorities. The full committee has been extremely productive. They've met seven times, released two reports, including an in-depth assessment of diversity and inclusion efforts of tech firms and a report on universal digital access, and jointly hosted with the FCC five symposium and workshops on broadband adoption and literacy, access to capital, broadcast media ownership, and tech supplier diversity. Another active area of Bureau work has been its review of proposed media transactions. Over the last four years, the Bureau reviewed over 15,000 applications to assign or transfer broadcast licenses. We carefully scrutinize each transaction to ensure that it complies with our rules and satisfies the public interest. Transactions involving foreign investment additionally require an evaluation of national security, law enforcement, and trade policy considerations. Many of the nation's largest broadcast groups presented transactions to the Bureau including iHeartMedia, Cumulus Radio, Raycom Media, Tribune, and Gray Television. Consistent with the recent trend in the media industry, often these major transactions sought ownership approval for non-traditional U.S. media participants, such as private equity firms and foreign entities. Our careful review of these transactions, which relies on advice from expert agencies in the executive branch, ensure that these transactions will result in stronger broadcasters that are better able to compete in today's market. While we will be able to modernize regulations where appropriate, we remain vigilant to ensure compliance with the rules on the books. There were several situations over the last four years that required us to take significant enforcement actions, including entering into a consent decree imposing a $48 million penalty, the commission's largest civil penalty ever issued to a broadcaster. We also entered into consent decrees with 106 radio station groups covering over 2000 stations that require adherence to our political file rules. And for the first time ever, we issued a notice of apparent liability for violation of the retransmission consent good faith negotiation rules. In this NAL, we proposed the maximum statutory forfeitures against eight TV station groups. As this slide highlights, on top of the many noteworthy items the Media Bureau has produced over the past four years, we also completed a tremendous amount of work on a daily basis. It has been an honor to work with such a great team on so many important and interesting issues. To close, I wanted to thank the extremely talented and dedicated staff of the Media Bureau. And Chairman Pai, I also wanted to thank you for your superb leadership these past four years. The Bureau could not have accomplished so much without your support, guidance, and most of all, your kindness. We wish you success wherever you go. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Kerry, for those kind words and for the description of the amazing work that the Media Bureau staff has done. Uh, with that, we'll turn to Ms. Cadu for her presentation as Chief of the in in Internet, sorry, Incentive Auction Task Force. 
It's a mouthful, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. <laughs> and good morning, commissioners. Thank you for inviting me to participate in today's meeting. I'm proud to summarize some of the incentive auction task force's accomplishments over the last four years, which is a period that coincided with the 39 month post auction transition during which 987 full power and class A television stations were required to move to new channels in order to clear the new 600 megahertz wireless band that was auctioned in the incentive auction for mobile broadband services. The success of the world's first spectrum incentive auction depended on meeting three objectives, delivering 84 megahertz of nationwide broadband capacity on time, promptly reimbursing television and radio stations for their transition costs, and assuring that consumers were not adversely affected by the channel changes. The success of the transition was not a given. Many were skeptical that our transition plan addressed resource constraints and interference issues in a way that would enable thousands of stations to build new facilities in only 39 months, or that we could develop the systems needed to make prompt payments in an unprecedented multi-billion dollar reimbursement program. And those challenges increased when a year into the transition, Congress expanded the reimbursement program, which required a new rulemaking, an expanded consumer education campaign, additional IT systems and reimbursement procedures, and doubled the number of stations eligible for reimbursement. I'm proud to report, however, that our efforts were successful. All 84 megahertz of spectrum was delivered on time and the 600 megahertz band is already being used to provide 5G services in large parts of our country. Moreover, reimbursement payments have flowed smoothly and the transition occurred in a manner that minimized any consumer disruption. Before sharing a few milestones, let me say that the Incentive Auction Task Force is a collaborative organization that marshals the talents of staff across the commission including the media, wireless telecommunications and consumer and governmental affairs bureaus and the offices of managing director, engineering and technology and media relations. Our success in meeting our transition objectives happened only because dedicated staff from all of these bureaus and offices did everything humanly possible to find practical solutions to the daily, if not hourly challenges that were inevitable in a project of this magnitude. The Media Bureau bore the lion's share of the effort, helping 987 repack stations and over 2,100 displaced low power TV stations move to new channels. Staff worked hand in hand with stations to address scheduling issues, as witnessed by the fact that they granted over 850 waivers and STAs while still keeping the overall transition on schedule. Staff has also reviewed over $2 billion in cost estimates and has approved over 93,000 invoices so far. The responsibility for processing the approved payments fell to our financial operations group in the Office of Managing Director. This required a host of new systems and procedures and their efforts have enabled nearly 1.5 billion in payments already. The close of the auction also did not end the significant effort required by the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. The Bureau's efforts to quickly grant wireless licenses enabled early payments to 175 reverse auction winners, making their spectrum available for the transition and auction revenues available to fund reimbursements. Notably, 104 of those TV stations are now channel sharing and can still be watched by television viewers. We also offered a comprehensive consumer support process to viewers who watch over the air television. Our contracting office worked quickly to retain a public relations firm and a dedicated rescan call center. Viewers were informed about the transition and how to rescan their TVs to reprogram them to receive the new frequencies when local stations moved to new channels. Working with the Office of Media Relations and the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, we reached tens of millions of consumers and successfully provided them with the information they needed to continue to receive their local stations, as witnessed by more than 5.6 million hits on our FCC web, uh, Rescan webpage and over 116,000 consumers aided by our specialized call center. 
In closing, I want to again thank the staff and add a word of appreciation for the many industry members who worked in close coordination with staff to get this job done. That public-private partnership was essential to completing the transition on time and bringing new broadband capacity to consumers nationwide. So thanks to everyone who helped this process get done. Uh, thank you, Ms. Cadu, for your remarks. Uh, would any of my colleagues like to offer any uh, commentary on the presentations? Uh, thank you again uh, to, the, to the staff. I mean, it's just amazing as it washes over us how much has been accomplished in the last four years. Um, so it's, it's, it's really great to, to see these presentations and get the chance to say, you know, thank you for your service. Really appreciate it. Thank you for all the hard work. Uh, and for my part as well, uh, thanks to uh, Chief Carey for incredible leadership of the Media Bureau. The MMRI is a great example of that, just how many rulemakings were done. And for each item, I was always struck by how lean but mean the Media Bureau team was. They worked so hard and so efficiently to get things moving. And I can't say enough how much I appreciated it and the chance to work with you uh, since 2007, back when I was in the Office of General Counsel. Uh, you've just been a, a great model for the rest of us in uh, public service at the FCC. And uh, for Ms. Cadu as well, you know, when I think of the work you've done over the last several years, I'm reminded of the Seinfeld episode about car reservations. You know, like anyone can take reservations. It was critical to hold the reservation. You know, anyone can auction off 600 megahertz spectrum. But what's really important is to transition people over the coming years. And given all the obstacles you've faced, uh, you know, objections on money or weather or you know, lack of work crews, et cetera, the fact that it was a smooth transition that really didn't make national news is a testament to your leadership and those under uh, that you have helped lead. So thank you again for the great work you've done to help deliver real uh, meaningful wireless innovation to millions more American consumers. It's not lost on us, and I dare say it's not lost on the American people as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, Madam Secretary, can you please take us to the next panel on today's agenda? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. The fourth panel will be pre presented by Patrick Weber, Chief of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, Rosemary Harold, Chief of the Enforcement Bureau, and Lisa Folks, Chief of the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary. And I believe we will start with Mr. Weber, uh, the Chief of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. Uh, sir, the floor is yours. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And as we've just hit noon, good afternoon, Chairman Pai and Commissioners Carr, Rosenworcel, Starks, and Symington. Today, I am pleased to provide a report on the work of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau over the last four years. CGB is home to eight divisions and offices. And while our portfolio is broad and diverse, our focus is on protecting and educating American consumers. One of CGB's top priorities has been fighting the scourge of unwanted and illegal robocalls. And we've led multiple actions to tackle this problem. In 2017, the commission adopted a first of its kind order enabling voice service providers to block calls from numbers that are obviously spoofed, such as those with invalid, unused, or unallocated numbers. A year and a half later, the commission empowered providers to better protect consumers by blocking unwanted calls based on reasonable analytics on a default basis. Last summer, the commission offered providers safe harbors to encourage more of them to block these calls. And just a few weeks ago, the commission went a step further, requiring providers to take steps to ensure their networks are not used to transmit illegal robocalls. We are also establishing a database that will en enable any caller to determine whether a phone number has been potentially reassigned, thus ensuring that consumers don't receive calls that are meant for a prior subscriber. And the commission recently adopted restrictions on calls from federal, state and local government contractors and adopted limits for the first time on the number of non-telemarketing calls to home phones. I am pleased to report that these actions, along with anti-robocall efforts undertaken by the Enforcement Bureau and the Wireline Competition Bureau, are beginning to have a positive impact. For example, according to the UMail Robocall Index, the number of robocalls in the United States dropped by more than 20% in 2020, the first annual drop 
in the history of the index. Last year, CGB highlighted two important milestones, the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act and the 10th anniversary of the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act. Over the last four years, we have worked to improve and safeguard access to communications for those with disabilities and improve telecommunications relay services. In 2018, the Commission strengthened the effectiveness and efficiency of captioned telephone services, determining that they could be provided using automatic speech recognition without the need for live communications assistance. Last year, CGB certified three providers to use this technology, each of which showed they will meet the Commission's minimum standards and perform as well or better than existing services. Video relay services can now be provided by communications assistants working at home, expanding the pool of qualified interpreters for people who use sign language to make video calls, and consumers can place direct sign language video calls to customer support call centers. In its efforts to rein in waste, fraud, and abuse of the federally administered relay services fund, the commission has adopted reforms that by 2022, will save the fund approximately $1.5 billion, making it possible to continue supporting vital accessibility services. During the last four years, the Commission has been especially active in bringing advanced communication services to tribal communities. CGB's Office of Native Affairs and Policy has visited 24 nation, Native nations, hosted 43 events, and held 20 tribal consultations. It has conducted outreach to Native nations regarding 5G network deployment and infrastructure streamlining, and played a critical role with respect to the 2.5 gigahertz rural tribal priority window. Its work with the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau to reach every federally recognized tribe resulted in over 400 applications with 182 licenses granted to date. And our Native Nations Communications Task Force recently submitted important recommendations to the Commission on improving tribal broadband deployment and tribal engagement. CGB oversaw the Hospital Robocalls Protection Group, which last month provided the Commission with best practices on how to combat robocalls to hospitals. We also oversee the Intergovernmental Advisory Committee, which in 2019 submitted key proposals on multilingual emergency alerting, disaster response coordination, and telemedicine. CGB has aggressively pursued consumer outreach and awareness initiatives regarding illegal and unwanted robocalls and caller ID spoofing. Our rural tour series featured 51 public events and 54 meetings with local officials, covering 4,600 miles over 13 states. We co-hosted events such as a robocalls workshop and a tech expo with the Federal Trade Commission and a program with a national nonprofit agency that distributed over 20,000 FCC tip cards inside grocery stores. A critical consumer education tool is our FCC.gov forward slash consumers website. Its content has averaged over 3.5 million page views per year and showcases our first in-house animated videos. In addition, all of our consumer publications are available in multiple languages, and we provided Spanish translation support to the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau during several emergencies over the last few years. CGB processes approximately 317,000 com consumer complaints per year. Over the last four years, we have served consumer complaints on providers within an average of two business days with a 99% provider response rate. We also manage the FCC's call center and answer around 120,000 calls per year. I'm especially proud of the work staff did last year to rapidly transition from a completely in-house call center to a completely remote one in response to the COVID-19 pandemic with no service interruptions. CGB has taken several during the COVID-19 pandemic to help consumers. Early in the pandemic, we clarified our rules so that consumers could be contacted by authorities with critical COVID-19 related information, such as testing availability, 
quarantines, and shelter-in-place requirements. We also ensured that relay services remained available and that critical information about the pandemic was accessible to people with disabilities. We created a COVID-19 consumer resources webpage and hosted a virtual event regarding COVID scams. We also tracked over 150 companies that went above and beyond Chairman Pai's Keep Americans Connected pledge. Working with other bureaus, we've also raised awareness about lifeline waivers, telehealth programs, and other initiatives to help consumers during the pandemic. In closing, I would like to thank the tireless and dedicated staff of CGB. Because of time constraints, I couldn't possibly include all of the incredible work CGB staff has performed over the last four years. I am greatly honored to be working alongside you. Each and every day, you make a positive impact on American consumers. Lastly, thank you to Chairman Pai and all the commissioners for your support of the Bureau. And to Chairman Pai, your focus during this pandemic on the health and well being of Commission staff is greatly appreciated and will be long remembered. Thank you again for the opportunity to share the great work of CGB. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Weber, for your presentation. We'll now turn to uh, the Chief of the Enforcement Bureau, Ms. Rosemary Harold. Uh, Ms. Harold, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and also thank you to all of the commissioners for letting us go on a bit about all the things that we've done over the last few years. In the last four, in fact, the Enforcement Bureau has taken almost 1,300 enforcement actions. These include 38 forfeiture orders, totaling more than $310 million, and 78 notices of apparent liability, resulting in proposed fines of almost $840 million. We've also signed 109 settlements with targets of investigations. These include payments of nearly $375 million and compliance plans. All of, nearly all of our consent decrees have plans that specify actions that targets must take to ensure future compliance with the law and our rules. All told, since early January 2017, we've issued more than $1.5 billion in proposed or actual penalties or collections via settlement. This total is an increase of more than 500 million from any prior FCC administration. As we've already heard, and as everybody knows, the commission receives more complaints about robocalls than about any other issue. Therefore, enforcement against unlawful robocalls and unlawful caller ID spoofing has been our top priority during the last four years. We've taken an unprecedented number of actions, imposing or proposing more than $450 million in fines to combat illegal spoofing. We've also used collaborative and creative approaches to attack unlawful calling campaigns. For example, we sent two batches of letters to companies that recently that were transmitting large volumes of robocalls with deceptive information about the coronavirus and we stopped them in their tracks, at least for now. We worked with an industry consortium throughout to trace back the source of spoofed calls. And thanks to the recent Traced Act that Congress enacted, that industry consortium is now an officially recognized partner in our efforts. We also routinely coordinated with other state and federal enforcement entities to share information and discuss efforts regarding the fight against unlawful robocall campaigns. Also, as you know, our field agents perform critically important work that often flies under the radar of those of us here at headquarters and probably the rest of the industry too. Our field agents routinely conduct investigations that track the sources of harmful interference and we're concentrating on helping public safety entities these days. We also they also provide on the ground expertise and support during political of conventions, sporting events, and after natural disasters. The work is often time consuming and requires agents to travel all over the country. But even with all those commitments, the Bureau has made pirate radio enforcement a priority. In the last four years, our agents have been particularly aggressive and creative in confronting pirate broadcasters, working with US attorneys and local law enforcement on investigations that allow us to impose significant fines and to seize radio transmission equipment. 
Overall, the Bureau's taken more than 450 enforcement actions against radio pirates since early 2017. We've also adopted new rules that allow us to improve our enforcement process. Thanks to authority from Congress, we've trimmed some procedures and we have the power to impose much heavier fines, up to $2 million per violation. Most exciting to me, I admit, the commission has new authority to directly pursue landlords who know that pirate broadcasts are occurring from their property and fail to stop them. We've already targeted several entities that own or control apartment blocks in New York City. And although we're in the early stages of these investigations, the initial responses from landlords has been encouraging. We also make it a priority to combat waste, fraud, and abuse in each of the universal service fund programs. These tend to be complex investigations, often involving years of work, specialized analysis, and close, co close cooperation with other bureaus and law enforcement partners. Even though our fraud division has only been up and running for a short time, it has already amassed an impressive list of accomplishments. For example, we've entered into two consent decrees resolving investigations concerning the rural health care program rules with settlement values of $32 million. We also signed a settlement with the New York City Department of Education concerning certain E-rate practices, which resulted in a repayment of more than $17 million to the Universal Service Fund, as well as relinquishment of rights to another 7.3 million in unpaid invoices. We issued a notice of proposed liability proposing a forfeiture of more than $63 million for multiple lifeline rule violations. And we've imposed a forfeiture order of more than $49 million for violations of the high cost program rules. Even as we pursued these cases, however, our investigation and hearings divisions telecom team continued to target compliance with our USF program rules. Recently, for example, we've entered into a $200 million settlement, the largest fixed amount settlement the commission has ever secured to resolve an investigation. This resolution concluded a probe concerning subsidies claimed for service to more than 880,000 Lifeline subscribers who were not actually receiving the services. Finally, we pursued enforcement actions in many other critical areas, including violations of the act and our rules, governing responses to 911 outages and broader network outages. We've protected the operational impact of the emergency alert system by imposing more than $900,000 in penalties on five separate broadcasters and cable entities for misusing EAA, EAS alert tones in entertainment and reality programming. Our Market Disputes and Resolution Division resolved a groundbreaking case involving poll attachment rates. That may sound like a dull subject, but it directly affects what American consumers pay for broadband services. And it set baseline precedent we can use in the future to enforce the new rules governing rates that utility companies may collect from incumbent telephone carriers. We've, take, we've got many more actions that we don't have time to recount here, of course, but quickly, I'd like to also note our work on cases that involve privacy of wireless phone users' location data and the orderly operation of the FCC's auction processes. Close to the end now, I'd like to highlight some of the things we've done to improve efficiency and transparency in EB. As noted earlier, um, in April 2019, the Commission created the Fraud Division. This group is composed mainly of experienced government fraud litigators that we have hired away from other government agencies. They specialize in investigating complex and egregious violations of the Communications Act and the FCC's rules. In June 2018, the Commission streamlined the Bureau's formal complaint process, adopting a more uniform set of procedural rules that should help improve those proceedings. In September of last year, the Commission adopted other procedural changes, this time to simplify many administrative hearings by enabling the Commission to decide to send certain matters to hearing on a written administrative record rather than a full live hearing before an administrative law judge. Finally, in April 2020, the Bureau published an enforcement overview, a guidebook designed to help stakeholders 
particularly non-lawyers, better understand the FCC's enforcement process and to do it in plain English. These were large and labor-intensive efforts and were possible only because of the diligent work of EB staff. While they don't necessarily generate headlines like some of our multi-million dollar fines, we're confident that these actions will pay dividends for the Bureau and for the Commission for years to come. In short, EB has had a very productive period, thanks in part to the strong bonds of professional respect and friendship we've nurtured and maintained over the last four years. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to all the commissioners for giving us the opportunity to do good work that helps the American public. I won't try to thank everybody in EB who deserves it, but I've listed at least some of their names here, and I will think of better tokens of gratitude in the coming days. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harold, for your presentation. And we'll now turn to the Chief of the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, uh, one Ms. Lisa Folks, who I assume will not be donning Eagles Green. What did you say, Mr. Chairman? We're trying to end things on a happy note, Lisa, so let's keep it civil, all right? Well, then you shouldn't have said anything. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Commissioner Symington, welcome to the Federal Communications Commission. Over the past four years, this commission and the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau have taken significant actions to make the public and our communications networks safer and more secure. We have strengthened the nation's 911 systems, enhanced emergency alerting, reduce the vulnerability of our communications infrastructure to national security threats, bolster network resiliency, and supported preparedness, response, and recovery efforts for an unfortunately large number of natural disasters. Let's begin with our extensive efforts to improve our 911 systems. We adopted rules that will help first responders determine the floor level of wireless 911 callers in multi-story buildings and action supported by a broad cross-section of public safety groups. We rejected calls to weaken the new rules and instead built upon them so that the benefits of vertical location accuracy will ultimately reach all Americans, not just those in the largest markets. We enacted rules under Carey's Law to help ensure that people who call 911 from multi-line telephone systems, which commonly serve hotels, office buildings and campuses can reach 911 directly and be more quickly located by first responders. We adopted rules to help ensure that dispatchable location information, such as street address, floor level, and room number of a 911 caller is conveyed with 911 calls, regardless of the technological platform used. We also issued annual reports to shine a spotlight on 911 fee diversion, that is, the practice by some states and jurisdictions of using the 911 fees collected on consumer phone bills for non 911 purposes. We then launched a proceeding on how to combat this problem and help ensure that the funding is used as intended to support our nation's 911 call centers. Over the past four years, we have also made significant improvements to the nation's emergency alerting systems. The commission adopted rules to improve the geographic targeting of wireless emergency alerts, which will help ensure that these life-saving warnings reach all and only those in affected communities. This will in turn promote greater confidence in and use of the system to save lives. We adopted a dedicated blue alert code so that state and local agencies can notify the public of threats to law enforcement and seek information to help them apprehend dangerous suspects. We worked with FEMA to conduct three nationwide emergency alert tests, including the first ever nationwide test of wireless emergency alerts. In the wake of Hawaii's false ballistic missile alert, we conducted an investigation and issued a report with recommendations to help guard against future false alerts. We also issued rules to help prevent future false alerts, as well as to promote more effective local emergency alert tests and public service announcements. 
and we hosted a public workshop to promote the use of multilingual emergency alerting and other methods for delivering emergency information to non-English speakers. The past four years have also been extremely busy for our emergency preparedness and response operations, whether in connection with natural disasters like hurricanes and wildfires, or in support of annual events like the Presidential State of the Union Address or the Super Bowl. When disasters struck, we activated our disaster information reporting system to monitor the status of communication services and support restoration efforts. We did this for hurricanes Zeta, Delta, Sally, Laura, Isaias, Harvey, Irma, Maria, Michael, Florence, and Dorian, a derecho in the Midwest, power shutoffs in California, and earthquakes in Puerto Rico. We also supported communication service restoration and conducted after-incident investigations. With Hurricane Maria alone, the commission issued 1,031 grants of special temporary authority and 23 waivers, processed 257 requests for assistance or information, and provided $116 million in immediate and short-term restoration support in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. We hosted a workshop to determine the information needs of the disability community, as well as federal and state, local, tribal, and territorial stakeholders during disasters and proposed rules to share outage information with states to support recovery efforts. Most recently, we worked closely with affected providers to monitor the service-wide outage resulting from the Nashville Christmas Day bombing. And the FCC's Operations Center has also helped emergency management and public safety personnel to save lives directly. For example, our watch officers coordinated the rescue of a crew member aboard a Chinese research vessel off the Alaskan coast, assisted the search for a missing aircraft in Texas, and provided vital technical assistance enabling a Florida police department to locate a dangerous and suicidal suspect even throughout this pandemic, our operations center remained open 24 seven to fulfill its life-saving mission. We have been focused day in and day out on promoting the integrity and reliability of our nation's communications networks, including monitoring outage trends through our network outage reporting system. We investigated major network outages, including an AT&T mobility outage in 2017, a CenturyLink outage in December 2019, and a T-Mobile outage in June 2020, and released public, uh, public reports with lessons learned to help prevent similar outages from occurring in the future. We improved the outage reporting obligations of submarine cable licensees to better promote national security while streamlining the reporting process. We promoted the security, reliability, and resiliency of the nation's communication system through the Communications Security, Reliability, and Interoperability Council, otherwise known as CISRIC, which among many efforts developed best practices to ensure the security of 5G and 911 networks, as well as mitigate security risks to legacy networks. In support of our national security mission, the Bureau designated Chinese companies Huawei and ZTE as national security threats, which bars universal service funds from being used to purchase or maintain their equipment or services. Our Bureau's licensing staff has also ably handled spectrum licensing for our public safety, safety constituents. From January 23rd, 2017 through the end of last year, the licensing staff processed a staggering 138,660 applications. We also expedited the completion of the 800 megahertz rebanding program by streamlining our processes and resolving issues with Mexico. While many of our efforts are public, the behind the scenes work the Bureau has done to promote the development of our professional staff also deserves its moment in the sun. The Bureau has spearheaded professional development programs to include expert panels, substantive and skill-based training, a mentoring program, and leadership forums. Employees from other bureaus and offices have often participated in these events. Our analytics team developed innovative remote internship programs to bring unique skill sets and out-of-the-box thinking to the Bureau. 
The Bureau enlisted 36 remote data science and national security interns from around the country to collaborate with Bureau staff on innovative projects with the support of mentors within the Bureau. In sum, it has been my privilege, privilege and pleasure to serve as the head of the Commission's Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau over the past four years. Thank you, Chairman Pai, for your leadership. We are grateful for the trust you place in our dedicated public, sa public safety team. Thank you to the commissioners for your support in our efforts. Most importantly, thank you to the Bureau's extraordinary staff. And you, and, and, and you know I'm going to say it, you know it, I know it, the entire Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau family rocks. So thank you to them for their work to promote the public safety, the public safety. Thank you. Well, thank you, Chief Folks. Uh, would any of my colleagues wish to offer any comments at this time? Uh, thank you uh, again to the to the team. Uh, Rosemary is someone I've known for uh, a long, long time now. Actually, the very first project I ever worked on as a baby lawyer was uh, under the supervision of Rosemary and Lisa was someone I met, you know, my first day at the FCC uh, back as an intern in 2002-2003 uh, in Enforcement Bureau. So great to see uh, your career and where you've uh, uh, ended up in helping to lead the FCC's public safety uh, efforts. And uh, not to sleep on Patrick. Um, a lot of people don't know this. He's actually a, a star fantasy football player. Uh, he loves to put his team on auto draft, pretend like he doesn't know what he's doing, uh, and then come from behind for the for the win at the end. So uh, thank you again for the, for the team for the presentations. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. And Rosemary and Lisa, I guess you could have nipped this in the bud, but here we are. <laughs> oh, sorry, Commissioner. Thank, sorry. You. thank you to all for your very hard work. Anybody else? Um, uh, yes. For my part, uh, let me just uh, thank all of the presenters. Uh, to the chief of the CGB, Patrick Weber, just an incredible job you've done. And your jurisdiction is so diverse. The engagement with tribal, you can't mail that in. You have to be there in person and really do the hard work. And you, you and your team did that. On Keep Americans Connected, the American people needed us to step up in a pinch. And you absolutely did that as well. The robocall work you've done, I mean, here in the field, I mean, here in uh, D.C., but also in the field, I'll never forget uh, the town hall we did with seniors in Lincoln, Nebraska, thanks to your leadership. And it was just such a great event. And it shows that you're delivering results for the American people. Uh, with Rosemary Harold as well, you've been such a terrific chief of the Enforcement Bureau. Uh, you know, it's every lawyer learns the essence of every right is a remedy. But in the case of FCC regulations, the remedy has to be enforced by you and your incredible team. And both here in headquarters and throughout the field offices, You've been the eyes and ears of the commission, making sure that our rules are enforced. So thank you for the incredible leadership you've made. And to the chief of the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, Lisa Folks, uh, thanks so much for that complete presentation. I was worried you're gonna pull a Nate Sudfeld there and just kind of tank in the last bit, but you really pulled through. Uh, appreciate that. And uh, But no, in all seriousness, uh, you know, yours job and everybody in public safety, it's a 24 seven job. I start my own days with reading those op center reports and whenever there's a disaster that strikes and you know there's going to be something happening, it's been a comfort to know that there are dedicated staff in the Public Safety Bureau led by you who are going to help us spring into action and help people. And I'll never forget the work you've done in places like Puerto Rico, Florida after Hurricane Michael, Texas after Hurricane Harvey, the wildfires in California. You've been a great leader of the Public Safety Bureau. And uh, I just want to give you a salute for all the work you've done. Uh, the workload has been unpredictable, but what you can predict is the professionalism of you and your team in handling those challenges. And that's no small feat. Thank you. Uh, Madam Secretary, could you please take us to the final panel on today's uh, meeting? Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, for your fifth and final panel, you will hear presentations from Sanford Williams, Director of the Office of Communications Business Opportunities, Deputy Managing Director Dina Shetler for the Office of Managing Director, and Thomas Johnson, General Counsel for the Office of General Counsel. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary. We will turn first to, of course, a full-time fan of the University of Virginia, but more important for these purposes, the Director of our Office of Communications Business Opportunities, Mr. Sanford Williams. Uh, Mr. Williams, the floor is yours. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Greetings, Chairman Pai, Commissioners Rosenworcel, Carr, Starks, and Symington, and Secretary Dortch. It is my pleasure to present to you on behalf of our team in the Office of Communications Business Opportunities, better known as ACBO, some of our accomplishments over the past four years. 
Chairman Pai, thank you for your service to the FCC and the nation. Public service is an important and essential part of our democracy. I wish you well in your future endeavors. Before I delineate some of ACPO's activities, I would like to acknowledge the other members of our team in alphabetical order. Andrea Brown, Cara Grayer, Larry Hudson, Belfort Lawson, Celeste McRae, Maura McGowan, Sharon Stewart, Shauna Wilkerson, and Carolyn Williams. I thank and appreciate these hardworking, diligent, and compassionate professionals who endeavor each day to do their best to serve the American people. The author L.R. Nose says the brightest stars are those that shine on behalf of others. I thank my teammates for shining brightly on behalf of their fellow citizens. ACPO promotes competition and innovation in telecommunications ownership and information services. The office also supports opportunities for small, women-owned, and minority-owned communications businesses. Additionally, we provide the regulatory flexibility analysis for commission items. Over the last four years, we have posted 71 small entity compliance guides and worked on approximately 400 regulatory flexibility items. One of the ways ACPO has successfully promoted competition and innovation is through our supply diversity workshops. Together with the Media Bureau, we have worked with the Digital Empowerment and Inclusion Working Group of the FCC's Advisory Committee on Diversity and Digital Empowerment, better known as the ACDDE, to host events that bring together diverse business owners and FCC-related entities who seek suppliers. These events have been successful and educational. ACPO has also worked with the ACDDE on other initiatives to empower disadvantaged communities and accelerate the entry of small businesses, including those owned by women and minorities, into the media, into industries focused on digital news and information, as well as audio and video programming. I thank Chairman Pai for her support and participation in these events, and thanks to Commissioners Rosen, Warsaw, and Starks for their support and participation as well. For the last few years, I represented the Commission by speaking at the HOPE Global Forum. The forum is operated by Operation HOPE in Atlanta, Georgia, and brings together entrepreneurs, influencers, local, state, and federal government officials, and community leaders. The HOPE Global Forums are a community designed to galvanize thought and action around building an economy that works for everyone. The forum has been an excellent platform to educate and network with folks across the nation about the FCC's work and mission. And it also has been a great resource for the FCC to learn from citizens uh, what is going on in their communities and how the FCC may effectively and efficiently serve them. ACPO has participated in the annual STEM for Us Cybersecurity Festival in Washington, D.C. This festival is usually held the same weekend as the Congressional Black Caucus Annual Legislative Conference. The festival is designed to educate and excite students about cybersecurity and STEM careers. ACPO has also set up an exhibit at the caucus's annual conference. ACPO has, along with CGB, participated in the annual National Conference of the National Asian American Coalition, better known as the NAAC, which is one of the nation's leading Asian American nonprofit organizations and advocates for home ownership affordability, economic growth in underserved communities, and small business development. The NAAC is the founding member of a sister coalition, the National Diversity Coalition, a nonprofit of diverse community organizers, faith-based leaders, and business owners which work together to strengthen communities. When we are not reaching out and engaging with our various partners and constituencies, ACPO staff wrote and produced a video series titled, Did You Know? A series of nine short videos designed to educate the public on topics pertaining to small, minority, and women-owned businesses, as well as the various functions of ACPO. The series is posted on the FCC's YouTube page and has been very helpful in succinctly communicating our mission. During the pandemic, ACPO has worked diligently to communicate with and stay connected with those we serve in different ways, including sending out weekly email updates, hosting webinars, and participating in virtual events. We will continue to be creative in the mix of ways that we carry out our mission. To conclude on a separate note, about six months ago, I wrote a piece in Medium after the death of George Floyd. I concluded that piece with the following words that I hope will guide the FCC and the nation as we all endeavor to make this world a better place. We are living through history. The future is now. If we are authentic, vulnerable, and honest with ourselves and each other, we can really create a better place where we can all breathe. We can do this. Together we go farther.
thank you all very much for your time. I appreciate it and have a wonderful afternoon. Well, thank you, Mr. Williams, for your presentation. I will now turn to Ms. Dina Shetler, the Deputy Manager, Managing Director within the Office of Managing Director. Uh, Ms. Shetler, are you there? Sorry, sorry about oh. that. <laughs> there we go. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. The Office of the Managing Director is very pleased to participate in today's open meeting, and after a particularly challenging 2020, I look forward to discussing OMD's contributions to the FCC over the past four years. I would like to start by thanking the FCC COVID-19 team, which includes OMD's human resources, information technology, security, and facilities professionals, along with our fabulous colleagues in the Office of the General Counsel and the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau. We have worked together closely to navigate the unique management challenges presented by the pandemic. In addition to this incredible team of calm, thoughtful, and caring professionals, I also want to thank each FCC employee and contractor for maintaining physical distance, wearing masks, working from home when asked, and continuing to carry out our mission in the public interest regardless of where we sit. From the start, the team, working with the Office of the Chairman, prioritized clear and frequent communication to staff along with a rapid shift to mandatory telework for more than 1,800 employees and contractors. Within days, our workforce had made the shift and adapted to this new environment where we continue to work effectively today. In addition to helping to keep the FCC functioning as usual, OMD's rapid design and deployment of an IT platform enabled the launch and successful implementation of the new $200 million COVID-19 telehealth program. And in April 2020, OMD began working with the Wireline Competition Bureau to implement the financial transaction and oversight components of the program. 2020 would have been a challenging year in OMD even had we not been dealing with the global health crisis. In 2020, pandemic or not, we were scheduled to move our headquarters from our home of the last 20 years to a beautiful new building in Northeast DC. The headquarters relocation was a project almost a decade in the works, but because of the pandemic, many of the carefully developed plans for packing and relocating had to be rewritten quickly and often. In the end, OMD's team packed and oversaw the relocation of 1,290 employees, 144 contractors, and more than 11,400 boxes of files and personal items. Completed the design, construction, procurement, and installation of furnishings and equipment in our new headquarters. Finished the decommissioning, which means the removal of all furniture and equipment from the FCC's old headquarters by the lease expiration date and moved across town to our new headquarters quickly and safely. We look forward to the day when everyone can be brought back together in our new home. In addition to carrying out these duties, OMD has continued to provide vital support for the FCC's auctions program. Specifically, we have ensured timely reimbursements from the TV Broadcast Reimbursement Fund. To date, OMD has paid over 67,000 invoices totaling over $1.4 billion, provided IT and operational support for five major spectrum auctions, including our first almost completely remotely managed auction and the ongoing $80 billion C-band auction, and two rural broadband reverse auctions. OMD also continued to make meaningful improvements to the oversight, financial management, efficiency, and integrity of the universal service programs, including meeting the following major milestones. Completing the design and launch of the National Verifier for the Lifeline Program. Completing the transfer of funds to the Treasury for both the $8 billion USF and $1.4 billion TRS programs and completing the timely transition to a new business process outsourcing or BPO, which substantially improved management and oversight of the E-rate program and resulted in significant cost savings and stronger information security controls. Significant additional actions taken by, the, by OMD include significant cost savings and improved services. Our administrative operations team saved more than $3 million by closing the FCC warehouse and contracting for offset mail processing and warehousing, put in place new multifunction copy machines, jettisoning outdated network printers and fax machines, relocated and reduced real property costs and square footage at field locations, reduced printed material and supply costs by centralizing ordering and supply storage, and cut costs by reducing leased fleet vehicles. Our financial operations team earned our fifth consecutive, consecutive clean audit opinion on the agency financial report, 
Uh, we modernized our legacy systems. Our IT group oversaw significant progress in the modernization of ULS, CORES, EAS, ECF, ECFS, and IVFS, all mission critical legacy IT systems. We strengthened our records management program. Our team in PERM and IT improved the commission's record management by implementing the capstone email records management program, updating FCC records management directives, expanding electronic record keeping and digitization, and developing and implementing the FCC-wide Lighten Up campaign. OMD also played a central role in the establishment in 2018 of the FCC's new Office of Economics and Analytics, an organization designed to better integrate economics and data analysis into the FCC's rulemaking and other actions. The legal, regulatory, personnel, technological, and administrative requirements associated with establishing an ambitious new office require the dedicated expertise and leadership of OMD. To close, on behalf of the Managing Director, Mark Stevens, and all of OMD, I want to express my sincere thank you to you and your team for your leadership over the past four years, but especially over the last 10 months as we together navigated the FCC through the dual unique challenge of the pandemic and simultaneous relocation of our headquarters. Well, thank you, Ms. Shetler, for your presentation. And the final presentation will be delivered by Mr. Tom Johnson, the General Counsel and of course, the leader of our Office of General Counsel. And Mr. Johnson, the floor is yours. Mr. Chairman, at this, my 40th open meeting as General Counsel of the FCC, it is my honor to share with you some of the incredible accomplishments of my office since January 2017. I would first like to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the trust that you reposed in me to serve the American people as the FCC's Chief Legal Officer. It has been the privilege of my career to defend against legal challenge all the work that the FCC has done to promote the deployment of 5G wireless services, to streamline burdensome and unnecessary regulations, and close the digital divide so that more Americans can have access to broadband services. I would also like to thank all the commissioners, as well as the hardworking staff and chiefs of the FCC bureaus and offices for their support of me and my office over the past three years. So let's start with some high level numbers. Over the past four years, we have conducted a legal review of over 650 commission level items and many more staff level items. We worked with OMD to process nearly 3000 public records requests under FOIA and cut the average response time in half. And our ethics team has played an indispensable role in responding to thousands of staff inquiries and reviewing thousands of financial disclosure reports. Meanwhile, our transactions, bankruptcy and fraud team have created enormous value for the economy and the American taxpayer. Their work includes reviewing applications for transactions valued at over $100 billion securing over $5 million in bankruptcy for the US Treasury and federal programs, and recovering over $200 million in funds for the Universal Service Program. Our litigation team, in turn, won in whole or in substantial part, 28 out of 31 appeals, or 90%, filed against the agency. We achieved these results despite being challenged on several of this administration's highest profile items. When we restored a light touch regulatory framework to broadband in the Restoring Internet Freedom Order, we were challenged in court. Yet after our defense of that order, in which I participated in a marathon five and a half hour oral argument on a snowy February day following a government shutdown, the DC Circuit upheld our reclassification of broadband as a Title I information service. When we modernized our approach to state and local infrastructure siting requirements to accelerate American leadership in 5D, uh, 5G deployment, we were challenged in court. But after no fewer than three of my attorneys defended our 5G infrastructure orders before the Ninth Circuit, the court upheld nearly all of our reforms. When we took an innovative and thoughtful approach to reallocating critical C-band spectrum for 5G services, we again were challenged. But the DC Circuit rejected those challenges, 
clearing the way for a record-breaking auction of the spectrum. We also made history in the long-running media ownership litigation that has played out for the past 17 years in the Third Circuit. When, re when we repealed decades old media ownership rules to help struggling local news outlets survive in today's diverse and highly competitive media environment, we were challenged in court and the Third Circuit for the fourth time in 17 years remanded the case back to the agency. But this time we were undaunted. With the DOJ's support, we persuaded the US Supreme Court to review the Third Circuit's repeated remands an oral argument in that case will take place next week. I'm also proud of the work that my tireless agenda review and general law attorneys have done to support the commission's mission. In coordination with the Office of Economics and Analytics, we put in place a legal framework for the commission to better incorporate economic analysis into its decision-making processes. We reviewed items tackling hard problems ranging from robocalls to serving rural and tribal areas to national security to ensuring the reliability of our critical public safety services. And as our FCC community faced unique challenges from office relocation to government shutdown to adjusting to remote telework, our ad law attorneys were there to tackle all the thorny fiscal, personnel, and other legal issues that arose. My attorneys also volunteered their time above and beyond their normal duties to assist with reviewing applications for CARES Act funding and other issues that arose due to COVID-19. All these accomplishments belong to the hardworking attorneys and staff that make up my office. While I cannot name each one individually, I can recognize them by putting them up on the following slides. Over the past three years, we have shared in each other's victories, celebrated each other's milestones, and consoled each other when tragedy struck. The thing I will miss most about leaving this position is losing the opportunity to work each day with this exceptional group of lawyers, colleagues, and friends. There are a few names that deserve special mention. First, my deputies, litigation deputy and former administrative law deputy and acting general counsel, Ashley Boisel, my current administrative law deputy, Michael Carlson, my deputy for fraud, transactions and bankruptcy, Michelle Ellison, and former litigation deputy, David Gossett. I could not have asked for a better group of lieutenants to assist me with defending the commission's important work. I would also like to thank my tireless assistants, Natalie Martinez and Shannon Hyatt, without whom literally nothing in our offices, let alone the trains, would run on time. I'd like to especially recognize the contributions of two attorneys who sadly passed away during my time as general counsel. Nearly 50 year appellate attorney fixture, Gray Pash, and 20 year veteran and founding member of our transactions and fraud group, Neil Diller. We appreciate their service and they will always live on in our hearts and in the commission's memory. I would also like to take a moment to celebrate the remarkable career of Richard Welch, who last month announced his retirement from the FCC after 32 years of service. Due to his decades of devoted work from his early days in the old Common Carrier Bureau to his current role as Deputy Division Chief for Litigation, Richard is a walking treatise of communications law history and precedence. We wish him and his family the very happiest time in retirement, but he will be sorely missed by his colleagues and by this agency. Finally, on a personal note, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to thank my wife, Catherine, and baby girl, commissioner in training, Caroline Lucy, without whose steadfast love and support, this dream would not have been possible. Mr. Chairman, as a federal agency, we are required to take into account expert opinion in making predictive judgments about the future effects of the rules that we put in place. Accordingly, I would like to conclude with the expert opinion of noted inventor and student of all sciences, Dr. Emmett Brown, who famously said in Back to the Future, roads, 
where we're going, we don't need roads. At the end of our journey together, Mr. Chairman, I can firmly predict that the policies we have put in place will lead to a more innovative, more empowering, and more connected future. Thank you. Well, thank you for the presentation. And uh, just for the record, Back to the Future references were always favored under this administration. Uh, I know my colleagues will probably have comments, but let me recognize first Commissioner Symington, and I apologize. I didn't see you uh, looking to speak in the previous panel. So let me turn to you first, sir, and uh, with apologies again uh, you know, for the interruption. Uh, not at all, not at all. I just wanted to express my uh, my appreciation to all the speakers in the previous panel, and now I'll have the chance to do it for the ones in the current panel as well. So <laughs> thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Uh, oh, Commissioner Starks, I see. Um, uh, you're muted. Thank you as well to this group uh, for the very hard work. Deeply appreciate it. And I think I saw Commissioner Rosenversal. I'm not sure. Well, I just was wondering if we're going to have an opportunity to talk a little bit more broadly about um, departures, arrivals, and all that. So just oh, let yes. me know. Okay. At least right. I will be. I don't know about others, but uh, it certainly will be. Okay. Uh, I'd also add my, my thanks as well to the last panel and uh, reserve some time for that uh, later portion of the meeting as well. Well, terrific. Uh, well, let me thank all of the presenters on this fifth panel. Uh, to Mr. Williams, you've been a fantastic chief of OCBO. And you know, I know we put a lot on your plate. And I remember meeting with you and your team early on when we said, you know, we want to bring you to the process early when it comes to you know, working on these items and generating some of the necessary work product that goes in there. But even beyond that, the work you've done to help diversify the communications marketplace is so important. I thought it was important in January 2017, and I think it's only more important today. And that wouldn't have happened but for your leadership. Thank you for putting the time in to make sure that everybody on the outside knows they have a shot at opportunity in this marketplace as well. And more generally for your vision of leadership, even outside of the FCC. It's something I deeply admire. Also to Ms. Shetler, uh, yeah, please uh, to convey to Mr. Stevens and of course the entire team how grateful we are uh, for all the work that OMD has done. You know, for me at least, I didn't realize until I took this position how integral OMD is to everything that we do from our IT systems to working on the new building uh, to making sure that the trains run on time in terms of payroll. And uh, even for me at least, you know, the security issues that have arisen over the last couple of years, making sure that my family and I uh, felt safe in our homes and going to work and in the building itself. And of course, during the pandemic, your uh, ability to make sure that every FCC employee had the tools at his or her disposal to be able to do their jobs, just a heroic feat. And I can't thank you enough for making uh, our staff the best they possibly could be. And last but not least, to Mr. Johnson, uh, the leader of our Gen Office of General Counsel, you know, thank you for all the work that you have done. Uh, obviously, shepherding through the administrative process, a ton of items, an unprecedented agenda that we had, but also defending a lot of those items, some of them very complex or controversial in court, and winning the vast majority of them. Uh, it takes really able lawyers to be able to do that. And uh, I know that you and your team have been able to do that uh, you know, quite well. So you know, thank you so much. And uh, I'll, I'll miss uh, your witty asides uh, you know, in the time to come, but I'm only one text or tweet away, I suppose. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, would any of my colleagues like to make any announcements at this time? Uh, yep, uh, Commissioner Carr? Uh, yeah, thanks. I just wanna uh, obviously follow up on the meeting today. Uh, we, we focused, you know, rightfully so, on all of the hard work that the FCC staff has been doing, but I also wanted to pause again and sort of just express my own you know, personal appreciation and thanks uh, to you, Ajit, uh, for your time at the FCC. You've been uh, just a courageous and principled uh, public servant over these last few years, and you're leaving behind, as we've got a little bit of a taste today, really an unparalleled record of accomplishments. And as I've said before, one that I'm not even sure would fit into your oversized coffee mug. Uh, whoever the next FCC chair is, they certainly don't need any advice uh, from me or likely from anybody. Um, they'll be very accomplished, uh, but I'll remind them simply that there is something called circulation uh, and things can be voted at places other than FCC open meetings. Uh, to put them, of course, on how they want to handle that. Uh, you know, look, Ajit uh, took the helm of the FCC back in 2017 uh, at a time when I think U.S. leadership in 5G was really in doubt and his reforms helped enable the private sector to build out new high-speed internet connections at an unprecedented pace, connections that we've all relied on uh, like never before uh, during COVID-19. 
Uh, and his leadership, I was just looking at some recent uh, data. Uh, it looked like internet speeds on the wireless side in this country have nearly tripled uh, since you took over leadership of the FCC. Uh, not quite the one word uh, at a time speeds that uh, some promised a, a few years ago. Uh, in the four years leading up to uh, Ajit taking over, a new cell tower builds in this country had effectively flatlined. There were 4,000 new towers built uh, in those four years leading up to your chairmanship. And in 2019 alone, there were 47,000 towers that were built. So I think there's a really a, a direct correlation between the policies you put in place and helping to unleash these builds. And the U.S. moved up actually on the wireless side, mobile wireless side, 22 spots uh, in terms of the global uh, speed ranking. We freed up under your leadership something like six gigahertz of licensed spectrum uh, at a time when a lot of people thought the, the coverage would be there and there wasn't going to be much more uh, joining. to find beyond that. Uh, and that's in addition to thousands of megahertz of unlicensed spectrum. So, you know, look, obviously, Ajit, as we all know, grew up in Parsons, Kansas. So he uh, uh, personally understands uh, the digital divide and what it means, making sure that every community in this country has a fair shot at next gen connectivity. I think he's the first FCC chair that uh, spent time in all 50 states, which I think enabled him to really see for himself, what are we doing that's working? What are we doing that's not working? Where do we need to course correct? Um, and obviously he did far more than just mark his time here uh, as chairman. He took on the tough policy debates, made the right calls for the American people, stuck by his principles through thick and through thin. Uh, and I think over time, uh, people will learn more about the thick and thin uh, that comes with being the chair of the FCC. Uh, but he did, you know, just a, a wonderful job. Um, I think, you know, national security was a, a top accomplishment. We made some real progress um, under the chairman's leadership with um, stepping up to the plate, recognizing the threats posed by communist China. And then, of course, with COVID, not only did we put in place um, under his leadership the COVID-19 um, policies that helped to keep Americans, helped to keep Americans connected, but also he looked out for the FCC staff. And obviously his team deserves a lot of credit for that. Uh, Matthew Berry, the chief of staff, uh, really just moved very, very quickly uh, before a lot of others in Washington to recognize the threat posed by COVID-19 uh, and to take very important early actions to protect the safety uh, of our workforce. Uh, so kudos, obviously, to him for that. You know, look, as as a former staffer, uh, Ajit was, I, I was, you know, Ajit has just a tremendous appreciation for what the FCC is as an institution. Uh, and I can think you can see that uh, in his time leading. He put together a really talented, diverse, strong team that we saw today. Uh, even before Ajit became chairman, uh, he was known for finding really talented staffers and, uh, and bringing them <laughs> and bringing them in uh, to work for him. Uh, that skill that he has certainly uh, has not uh, diminished over time. Um, and obviously on a personal level, you know, Ajit is, is just – He's one of the most kind and earnest people uh, you could ever hope to meet, certainly uh, in this town. And I've been a, benefited myself greatly from his friendship, uh, his mentorship, really, his advice over the years. And I think the American people have benefited greatly. So I really want to wish uh, Ajit, uh, Janine, your kids, and obviously your, your latest addition, Ginger the Bulldog, um, all the best in your next endeavors. And again, kudos to your team. You know, I mentioned – Matthew Barry and the work that he's done. Obviously, Nick Degani deserves, I think, special uh, mention as well, um, playing a, a lead role behind the scenes on a lot of the policy issues and uh, crunching through work at a, a probably an unprecedented pace. And so uh, I think all of you have been uh, greatly appreciated by me. I um, want to thank each of you for your public service. Uh, I'm glad that we will get to stay in, in touch, at least as friends. Um, and then maybe when your recusals eventually expire, maybe beyond that. But um, really a heartfelt thanks and appreciation. Um, obviously, you know, Ajit started here in 2012. Last thing, I, I did look up, you know, everyone knows that Ajit is a big pop culture person. So to put in perspective how long uh, Ajit has been on the agency, you don't need to look at his gray hairs now to, to, to realize that. But back in 2012, the top song was actually uh, Carly Rae Jepsen's Call Me Maybe. That's how long Ajit's been on the commission. The top <laughs> movie or one of the top movies was Life of Pi, which, you know, the trade press loved and journalists loved to try to come up with, you know, different references to Life of Pi when Ajit came on to the commission. Uh, and the top app or one of them was Angry Birds. So that oh, gives you some perspective. Far, um, 
simpler times, I would say, far simpler times back in 2012. So uh, obviously, kudos to Ajit. Congratulations on a tremendous, tremendous run uh, in public service. And I'm excited to see whatever uh, new challenge you have and, and new successes to come. So uh, thank you. Well, thanks so much, Commissioner, to Brendan uh, for your uh, leadership, for your friendship, and uh, for the very kind words uh, this afternoon. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, Commissioner Rosenworcel. Sure. Um, all right. I'm going to have to follow up that discussion of angry birds, but I, I'm going to try. <laughs> I'm going to try. Um, so, look, this is the first meeting of the Federal Communications Commission in 2021, and it's the first meeting with Commissioner Nathan Symington. So, a hearty welcome. And of course, it's also the last meeting with our colleague, Chairman Ajit Pai. And to commemorate it, we just had this um, series of presentations from agency staff about the work that they've done during his tenure. And for those presentations, and of course, the ongoing work of staff, let's uh, offer a big thank you. A special thank you really is in order because as this pandemic raged, they all worked from home and in the process, they demonstrated that their command of communications policy and their commitment to public service is really second to none. And of, you know, that's not to say it's always been easy. Um, I know because I too am often working from home and playing a lot of different roles. One moment I'm uh, returning an office call, another I'm speaking via video at an online conference, and in yet another I'm chief Wi-Fi fixer and snack maker. This meeting is really a way to express our gratitude. So again, let me say thank you. You know, this meeting also takes place a week after the insurrection at the Capitol. And um, it's hard to sit here now without acknowledging that the images of that day linger. They're really hard to shake. I worked for many years in the Capitol, and I know it's towering heights, secluded corners, and labyrinth hallways better than most. But you know, it's not the loftiness of those spaces that I've always found most compelling. It's what's down below on the floors. I've traversed them too many times to count, heading back and forth, clicking on the tiles in less than sensible work shoes. I think the most beautiful floor tiles in the Capitol are the mid 19th century and caustic mosaics. You see the clay is inlaid, so the colors on those tiles are especially vibrant and diverse. It's like the metaphor for our union is right there on the ground. Even where these mosaic floors are uneven and worn, what strikes you most is the durability They've survived so much in our history. History, of course, is always being written. And the violence done to the Capitol last week is an especially ugly chapter. To see those sacred spaces desecrated stings. To see those gorgeous floors smeared with feces and hate hurts. To see the Confederate flag paraded across those tiles, sears, and burns. And to watch those disowning the hatred that brought us here when for too long they walked too casually along aside it is difficult. Now it was Martin Luther King Jr. who said, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Now we have an opportunity to lean into the light. As a nation, we need connections, physical and digital that strengthen our mutual bonds we need connections that remind us that our states are united and that our interdependence is powerful. And as if on cue, a new appropriations law has provided this agency with authority to help just do that. Congress directed us to establish an emergency broadband benefit to expand access to high-speed connections and assist those struggling in the ongoing economic crisis. It tasked the agency with expanded support for telehealth and provided funding that will make our networks more powerful and more secure. We also cannot forget the millions of students caught in the homework gap because they lack high-speed service at home and are still locked out of the virtual classroom. In short, we have real work to do, work that helps ensure that safe, reliable, and affordable communications reach 100% of this country, rural areas, urban areas, and everything in between. So this is what lies ahead, but we started today with presentations that look back. 
So let me end by thanking the chairman for his many years of public service. Let me also praise him for the work he has done to help keep those who work here safe during this pandemic. He went above and beyond to keep the staff of this agency informed and engaged in a time of crisis. And for this, he deserves great credit and appreciation. And I know he knows this, but it bears repeating, serving the American people is a tremendous honor. I wish him the best in the future. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner, for those kind words. Uh, anybody else? Oh, Commissioner Starks. Yes, well, um, uh, a few words and remarks for uh, the Chairman Ajit. Uh, and though obviously, although Ajit and I belong to different political parties, we share a deep bond that goes deeper than party affiliations, and that is that we are Kansas City Chiefs fans. Uh, and so unlike some <clears throat> Johnny-come-latelys, uh, named Brendan, but we won't go there. Uh, Ajit and I are personally familiar with the cold winds, the snow, and the weather that comes along with a bitter end at the game uh, at Arrowhead Stadium. And so from the very day, uh, more seriously, uh, that I was nominated, became a commissioner, uh, Ajit, you've always been uh, a gracious and welcoming and friendly um, uh, chairman and, and, and a true example of Kansas nice. Uh, and so I've always deeply appreciated in that, and as has been said a number of times, but is worth foot stomping, uh, how you always have uh, treated the staff uh, well and fairly and um, uh, always congratulate them on their first open meeting presentations and thinking of ways to make sure that the staff knows how deeply they're appreciated. We obviously have worked together on a number of policy areas, national security issues, 911 calling, preventing robocalls. Uh, but it's worth mentioning that I'm particularly proud of our work together on the Early Career Diversity Initiative. We all, we all have a collective duty, a shared responsibility to work together to ensure that our industry draws the best talent from all backgrounds. And Ajit and I share that the initiative will bring FCC additional law students, other people of color, uh, engineers who are going to be that next generation of leaders at the FCC, at the communications sector, the tech sector as a whole. Uh, and so it's it's a nice coincidence that, uh, Ajit, your final open meeting is the very first uh, time that I have a hire under this program here uh, in my office. And so before I close, again, as has been said, a hearty note of thanks to Matt Barry and OMD and Ajit's team that has kept folks safe. Uh, they handled the closing of the portals building, the shift to full-time telework, a move to a new building, and have done a great job of keeping everyone informed and safe and uh, folks not missing a beat. And so uh, to, to, to the, your team and to Matthew as well, uh, a, 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 deep, uh, a deep appreciation. And so while we've had our moments as ever uh, in the policy back and forth, as coach Andy Reid once said, not all of Mozart's paintings were perfect. Uh, but <laughs> Ajit, good luck, my friend. Uh, wish you and your family, of course, the very best on what comes next and uh, we'll be in touch down the road. Well, thanks so much, Jeffrey. It's been a pleasure to work alongside you, including on that fantastic early career uh, staff diversity initiative, which you deserve all the credit for. I look forward to rooting alongside you as a civilian as Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid lead us once again to the promised land in a couple of weeks. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, oh, Commissioner Symington. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Pai. So, um, I'd like to, I guess, first of all, express my appreciation uh, for uh, all of your work, but but first to make a bit of a, a more general statement. So I'm honored and humbled to be here today at my first public meeting as a commissioner. Uh, first, I'd like to recognize the efficiency and professionalism of the entire FCC staff, despite the difficult circumstances. It's been inspiring to hear about the incredible work of all the bureaus, offices, and task forces reporting today. They've done great work in uncertain, uncomfortable times. Um, as an immigrant who has chosen the USA as my country, I'd also like to express my confidence in the vigor and health of American democracy and the institutions supporting it, such as the FCC. At times when passions have run very high, the FCC staff have quietly and competently performed vital, essential work that rarely makes headlines, but touches and permeates all levels of our national life. And then as the Pi Commission draws to a close, I'd like to express my appreciation for its visionary and courageous work over the years, to thank the chairman for his greatly appreciated public service, to express my thanks for the chance to work alongside him, however briefly, and to wish him all the best in the future. 
So thank you all, and I look forward to working with the incoming administration and the commission staff in the public interest as we prepare for um, as we prepare for for this uh, upcoming transition. Well, thank you, Commissioner, and uh, best wishes to you in the exciting days ahead uh, during your time at the commission. Uh, well, I actually have a few announcements as well. They probably won't surprise you. Uh, and I'll start with uh, continuing the tradition that I started as a commissioner, which is announcing uh, some folks who are retiring from the FCC, uh, starting with Bob Nelson. Uh, this one really hurts uh, for those of us who know him. Bob is in the International Bureau. He's had an actual, just an amazing career, uh, both in the public and the private sectors. In the private sector, he actually built in satellites and integrated them at launch sites. And we were fortunate to have him at the commission. He's been instrumental to the FCC and to the International Bureau in particular as chief of the satellite division and more recently uh, the chief engineer of the International Bureau, where he played a big role negotiating cross-border uh, spectrum issues, analyzing spectrum or satellite applications, leading issues for the United States at the World Radio Communication Conference, which I had a chance to see in person uh, during the ITU deliberations in 2019, which were not easy and providing his vast satellite engineering expertise to interagency partners. He leaves a big void in the Bureau, to say the least, and at the Commission. But uh, I just want to thank you, Bob, for the rent public service you've rendered. You've been a terrific uh, friend and ally to the Commission over the years, and I wish you all the best and a very happy retirement. Uh, next, uh, from the Enforcement Bureau in the Field Operations Unit, uh, we're going to miss the leadership and the expertise of Ron Ramage, uh, who's currently the regional director for the field Southeast region. He'll be retiring in early 2021 after 37 years with the Federal Communications Commission, 37 years. Uh, he began his career in the St. Louis field office, St. Louis being the city that lost the 1985 World Series to Kansas City, just in case you didn't know. Uh, he started there as an engineer, and then he moved to senior engineer and district director. In 2016, he moved to Atlanta to become Region 2's regional director. Uh, more recently, uh, Ron Abley served as the acting field director for 16 months while we searched for a new permanent field director. Uh, Ron, among his many other accomplishments, is a native of Kansas, as you know, Jeffrey and I are, and he's also a dedicated Chiefs fan. Uh, Ron, thank you for your service to the commission, and uh, we very much wish you and your family well. Uh, my, one last announcement on my part. Uh, this is my 105th meeting as a member of the FCC. And I don't know if you heard, but this is my last as well. I'll be departing the commission on January 20th. Uh, in fact, in recognition of the fact that it's my last meeting, I actually wore the same outfit that I wore at my first one in May of 2012. A uh, little tighter now than it was then, but nonetheless, uh, it does the trick. Uh, but uh, these meetings have uh, been held thanks in part to amazing uh, FCC staff. And I want to take this opportunity uh, to thank Jeff Reardon and Steve Balderson from the Office of Media Relations. For those of you who attended our meetings in person or if you're now watching over the web, you're doing that because of these two individuals. You'll never see their faces, you know, you'll never hear their names, but they are the glue that makes this commission work on meeting day. So thank you to Jeff and to Steve. Moreover, they're just funny as hell. I love talking to them. I'm gonna miss uh, talking to them all the time. And uh, also for today's spe special thank you to Deandra Wilson and Alma Hughes from the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. Uh, they enabled all of those PowerPoint presentations that you saw to be displayed while the chiefs were going through the various presentations. Uh, and also, I want to thank Marlene Dorch, our secretary. Uh, Marlene, you're the mainstay of these commission meetings. You keep us uh, moving smoothly from one item to the next, and you do so with such uh, characteristic grace and dignity. And I can't thank you enough for the work you've done in being the point of presence for the commission on meetings and through our electronic comment filing system. Uh, thank you as well to the FCC commissioners that I have had the deep honor of serving alongside in alphabetical order, Brendan Carr, Minyan Clyburn, Julius Janikowski, Rob McDowell, Mike O'Reilly, Jessica Rosenworcel, Nathan Symington, Jeffrey Starks, and Tom Wheeler. What an honor it's been to be on the dais, literally and figuratively with you, as we strive to advance the public interest. Even when we might disagree, we agree far more often, and we are always looking to that same guide stars. What will make the American people better off tomorrow than they are today? And in that spirit, I wanna wish the future commission well. All four of you are incredibly talented, smart, hardworking, dedicated public servants. Uh, your success in the future will be American success. And just know that I and millions of others like me out there are going to be rooting for you to do a great job. Uh, next, I also wanna thank those who have served in my offices. 
uh, both when I was a commissioner in the office of Commissioner Pai and in the office of uh, chairman. And uh, in alphabetical order, uh, Lori Alexiou, Allison Baker, Rachel Bender, Matthew Berry, Michael Karowitz, Brendan Carr, Nick Degani, Deanne Irwin, Justin Falb, Gene Falano, Aaron Goldberger, uh, Christine Hackman, Montana Hyde, Melissa Kirkle, Nathan Lemer, Kim Matos, Carlos Minix, Zenji Nakazawa, Jeff Newman, Nirali Patel, Courtney Reinhard, Andy Rowan Wiley, Alex Sangenis, Jay Schwartz, Sean Spivey, Allison Steger, Evan suarez Traber, and Preston Wise. It's one thing for a commissioner or a chairman to get out there and spout whatever nonsense comes to his mind extemporaneously. You all did the hard work. You were the foot soldiers of the revolution to help close the digital divide, promote innovation, deliver value, and transform how the FCC operated. And I want to thank you for the many long hours over many long years. Uh, and it's been a pleasure working with you, and I look forward to continuing our friendship in the years to come. Thank you as well uh, to the Bureau and Office Chiefs and Acting Chiefs who have served under my leadership. Uh, Ashley Boisel, Michelle Carey, Michael Karowitz, Brendan Carr, Nick Degani, Lisa Folks, Nisha Gundelsberger, Jane Halperin, Rosemary Harold, Brian Hart, Larry Hudson, David Hunt, Paul Jackson, Tom Johnson, Julie Knapp, Allison Cutler, Wayne Layton, Julia McHenry, Chris Monteith, Ron Rapazzi, Mark Stevens, Don Stockdale, Tim Strachan, Tom Sullivan, Jennifer Tatel, Duana Terry, Patrick Weber, Mark Wigfield, and Sanford Williams. Your leadership of these bureaus and offices has helped us deliver the results, many of which we've heard about today. Thank you so much for stepping up and serving your country over the last four years. Uh, also, the heads of the Inter Incentive Auction Task Force and the Rural Broadband Auctions Task Force, past and present, Gary Epstein, Chelsea Fallon, Michael Jansen, and Jean Cadu. Uh, last but not least, on this front, I want to thank the FCC's press secretary, the uh, incredibly talented Tina Pelkey, also from Kansas, who did a fantastic job during her time at the commission uh, coordinating with us in explaining our views to the outside world. Last but not least, on a personal note, I want to thank Matthew Barry and Nick Degani. Old friends, we go back a long ways, and Matthew, I will forever remember that lunch we had in 2009 when we thought, hey, wouldn't it be kind of funny if someone ended up tapping you to serve on the Federal Communications Commission? Well, we got what we asked for, my friend. Thank you for all the hard work that you've put in over the years, and in particular, the way you stepped up and showed everybody who works at the FCC that your top priority, as is mine, is making sure that our team is safe. You're an incredibly smart person, you're a good friend, and uh, that'll never change in the time to come. And Nick Degani as well. The heavy lifting you've done to help our policy uh, agenda move through, it's been incredible. I don't know where you find the bandwidth, pardon the pun, to get all this work done when you sleep, but nonetheless, it's produced real results for the American people, and I will always be grateful for your friendship. And on the home front, I wanna thank my wife, Janine Van Lanker, it's been a good four years, it's been a long four years, and that public service on my part has been borne in part by sacrifices by you. And I just want to say thank you for enabling me to be a public servant low these many years. And to my kids, Alexander and Annabelle, uh, the Nuggets as we call them, they have been the lights of my life and no more so important, I think, than they've grown up at the commission alongside me. And I want to thank them for uh, being just such wonderful human beings that remind me constantly about what is important in life. Uh, to my parents, Bhardraj and Radha Pai, uh, Indian immigrants who came to 1971 with eight bucks and a transistor radio and a belief in the American dream. And uh, uh, I hope I made you proud. Uh, damn it, I gotta turn this video off. Ah! Okay, uh, to, to my sister, Sheila Pai, uh, just a good friend and a constant confidant. It means a lot to me that you've always been there. And to my in-laws, Bob and Marianne Van Lanker and Bobby Van Lanker, uh, even though you're Browns fans, you know and have always guided me toward what will make me successful in life. And I want to thank you uh, so much for that. And the many other family members and friends uh, who supported me along the way. I would never have made it without you. Uh, your emails and your tweets and even your letters, actually, uh, have meant the world to me. And they've really inspired me to do my best. And I'll just close with something that... Uh, uh, my grade school principal, Mr. Rex Toomey, told me not long ago, uh, you know, it was kind of a stressful time. I was you know, dealing with a lot of stuff. And 
he actually sent me a message that kind of bucked me up and put me in the right frame of mind. And he said, I'm so proud of your accomplishments, but I'm not surprised. Godspeed in your endeavors. Onward and upward, my friend. To Mr. Toomey and to all those who stood with me over the last four years and the last eight, thank you from the bottom of my heart. It's been the ride of a lifetime and only in America. If my colleagues don't have any further announcements, Madam Secretary, could you please announce the date of the next FCC agenda meeting? Oh, I'm sorry, Madam Secretary, I think you're muted. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's been a pleasure. I'll miss you. <laughs> the next agenda meeting of the Federal Communications Commission is Wednesday, February 17th, 2021. Until then, we stand adjourned. Thank you, everybody.